Our attention has been hijacked by pirates. Mm -hmm. And I know this because I used to work with those pirates. We're all given an eternal guidance system, and we have been severed from that in such a way that very few people actually utilize it. This is a virus. It's not on the battlefield, it's in the mind. Always find in any culture where there is master and slave, you can always find happy slaves. When people are desperate and dependent, then they will look to the authority figure to lead them, and they will be happy when someone comes along and says, you do nothing except for the work I tell you to do, and I'll give you just enough to survive. And there are people that are actually happy with that because they don't know what they're capable of. They have forgotten. If we can come back into just feeling the gratitude once again for the profound privilege of being alive, of waking up and having these challenges face us, to know that they're actually calling us forth to do what we are supposed to do in these bodies while we're here. And all we need to do is stop for a moment and understand that the distractions are all by design. Empire will come. Anti-life will come, and it'll come to the gates of the Shire. But unless we go meet it where it is, it's coming for all of us anyways. There's no escaping. Like, what would we want more than an opportunity to shift the course of humanity in some way, to participate in a greater movement for the liberation of our people? Mickey Willis is best known as a filmmaker, and his latest film, The Great Awakening, was one of the most powerful films that I've seen this year. It really tells a story about what the hidden agendas and what the hidden movements that are underneath the surface moving within our society really are all about. And the conclusions of that will be surprising. So I invite you guys to take in this podcast, open your mind to the darkness that's in the world and the ultimate beauty and triumph that is coming for all of us who are fighting for a more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. Coinciding with the release of this podcast, we also have a new documentary film through our production house, Chakaruna Media, with the support and production of Ben Stewart. And the film is called Unsafe and Ineffective. But what we really wanted to do was create a balanced, unsensationalized approach to really look at the claim that was made and repeated by politicians, leaders, and media throughout the pandemic, which said that these shots were safe and effective. And we explore the idea. Were they? Were they safe? Were they effective? And what course of action should we take now? And what was done to actually suppress the information that was coming out about the safety and efficacy of these shots? So if you're interested, please go to Unsafe and Ineffective for a sneak peek of this new film, which I'm really excited to share with all of you. Again, unsafeandineffective.com. So enjoy this podcast with Mickey Willis. Mickey, it's good to see you, brother. It's good to see you too, Aubrey. Yeah, these are some of the most complex and also beautiful times that I think we could be involved in because what does someone with a desire, which we all have, to stand for something that's meaningful? Like what would we want more than an opportunity to shift the course of humanity in some way, to participate in a greater movement for the liberation of our people from forces that have been since beginningless time, really, trying to look to control and use force and gain power in this kind of totalitarian pyramid where there's one ego at the top of everything, controlling everything beneath it and stand for the other side, which is a flourishing of the individuality and sovereignty of all beings to work, as you said, incredibly in your film, Great Awakening, through symbiosis, just like a rainforest works. Yeah. How does a rainforest work? Is there the rainforest oligarchs that's, that tell the, tell the butterflies to go to this plant and the frogs to eat these mosquitoes and this? No, it works naturally because there's a force called God. Mm -hmm the divine mystery, the universe, source, whatever you want to say. But there's a force that's driving us towards symbiosis naturally. But if we lose contact with that force, then the ego puts itself superimposed in that position of, I know better than all you idiots. I know better than you frogs. I know better than you bats. I know better than you tapers. I'm going to tell you exactly what you can and can't do. And then it all fucking falls apart. 
Mm -hmm. because there's a divine intelligence that's greater than any intelligence, greater than fucking Klaus Schwab and whoever else is thinking that they're the greatest mind and they're going to solve this. No, you're not, bitch. Mm -hmm. Like, listen, listen to the intelligence that's moving in you as you and through you if you allow yourself to connect to it. And that's really what I left your film with was this deep feeling of, man, like we have to get back to both a spiritual understanding, understand the philosophy of the Republic that the United States was founded as, mm -hmm. and then our own individual responsibility. So it's all the way from that superstructure of the divine moving through us and moving through the world to create natural symbiosis to the infrastructure level of our government. And then the social structure level of how we, you know, support families and communities mm -hmm. and how we build our own natural symbiosis instead of isolation leading to this solipsistic, you know, it's all about me and I got to figure it all out. Like, no, we're going to figure this out together and together we're going to make it through. <laughs> Open with a bang. Yeah. I love I it. Yeah, bro. So one of the things that one of the things that I had not fully comprehended mm -hmm. was that actually communism. I was like, why are we worried about fighting communism? Right? Like it was like that was in the past. Yeah. You know, and like, what the fuck were we doing in Vietnam anyways? And like, and I still don't say that that's a justification for the Vietnam War or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I actually understood a spark of what maybe some people were thinking was like actually this is a virus mm -hmm. and this virus which leads to totalitarianism which leads to the depolarization of the which leads to people who are no longer free is actually a virus that needs to be fought but now it's not on the battlefield it's in the mind yep and but the link between this communist quote communist agenda I was like, nah, really? Come on, we're over that. The Cold War ended, you know? Like, but we're kind of not over that. Well, that's exactly the awakening I had when I was on the road with Bernie Sanders in 2016, as I opened the film with my experience there and being a full-fledged far, far left Bernie bro and being 100% all in so much that I donated a, almost a year of my life to help build his grassroots campaign with media. And it wasn't until I was on the road and asking tough questions of all of his entourage and personnel that I started to realize that either they didn't really know what they were fighting for and, or they did and they were hiding something. And as I started to dig deeper and, and start to look around and recognize that there are a lot of symbology that I couldn't understand why mm -hmm. there were Che Guevara shirts and sickle and hammer stickers on laptops and water bottles and linen shirts. And, and I thought it was just young people trying to be edgy. And then I started to ask, what, what is this about? What, what is the, you know, this attraction to linen? And then they started to really open up to tell me the thing I didn't want to hear. Because at the time I didn't know a whole lot about socialism, but having been raised by a single mom on welfare, the idea of helping people at the bottom, of making sure that no one's left behind, sure. was like, that's all I needed to hear. Um, but then these young people explained to me that, you know, Marx always said that socialism is just a stepping stone towards communism. And I said, that, that's what you want? And they said, oh yeah. And then they would go out of their way to convince me that it was growing and, and that it was the only model that would save America. And it's the only thing that would stop the empire and, and the greed and capitalism and all the stuff that they thought was at the root of the problem. And, uh, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that they were fighting for that. And I would ask them questions like, when has that actually served the people that really work? Can you give me an example of that? And they would say, no, there really isn't one because it hasn't been fully attempted the way that, you know, Bernie's going to do it and we're, we're going to do it. It's going to be a different communism. And I had to dig into what do you think communism is ultimately? What is that? And you nailed it here in, in, in your opening monologue. Um, ultimately, it's, it's when the state owns and controls everything. Mm -hmm. And so then I would say to them, I would, I would ask tough questions like, do you trust the federal government? And all of them were disenfranchised young people that would say, no. And I'd say, so how this transfer of wealth you're talking about, this taking from the rich to, to help the people at the bottom, how will that take place? 
And they would say, through taxation. And I say, well, who's collecting the taxes? And they say, the government. And I said, do you like how the government spends your tax money now? No, I think it's theft. So there's, you understand there's a disconnect here yeah. between what you're saying, what you realize, what you see, and you want to give the federal government more of our wages. And it's really, you know, that's taxation is one of the major ways that they can control us. Mm -hmm. um, they can limit you. They don't want guys like you. They don't want guys like Elon Musk. They don't want guys like Joe Rogan, people that have worked their asses off to amass enough wealth that they can go by Twitter, you know, and reopen the public square to the people. They don't want people to do that. They want everyone to be, when they talk about equality, they do want equality. They want everyone at the bottom. Yeah. Equally at the bottom. Yeah. A quality of outcome and not opportunity. That's right. And that it has never, it has never really worked. Now, some people could argue, well, well, China's actually doing a good job in the world, but, and in some ways they are being effective as an empire. Mm -hmm. They're conquering by buying. And, but if you really listen to someone like Lily Fang, you really go into the history, 80 million people killed by Mao in That's horrible right. ways, like yeah. people imprisoned, yeah. you know, at the, at the drop of a hat. And I look at these like 15 minute cities mm -hmm that are, you know, all the rage in a certain sector of what the future, this great reset, what this new world looks like. And it's like, oh, that's a, that's a really convenient way to be able to lock and sequester people away and do what they did in Shanghai during COVID, which is just close the roads, close the gates, you know, lock everybody in this little, you know, kind of internment camp, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and be able to isolate and sequester everybody in these different places and you start to wonder and question like what is the real agenda behind all this and it really looks to this idea of a collectivist extreme collectivist society mm -hmm. which is based on a pyramid mm -hmm. and this pyramid always has somebody at the top it always does it like it doesn't matter this is never this is never an equal an equal kind of playing field this is always a pyramid everywhere you look there's the supreme leader who ends up getting himself worshiped like a god usually in some capacity or another mm -hmm. you know you offer devotionals and do this whole thing and then the pyramid starts with somebody at the top and then it moves into that oligarch level and then it moves and it's just a a structured hierarchy with a few people at the top and everybody leveled and flattened out at the bottom with no upward mo no mobility at all mm -hmm. and that is not the fucking world we want to live in. No. And you, you mentioned China, and it's important to look at that really as a case study, which is why I spend so much real estate in The Great Awakening delving into China and what's going on there. And I've interviewed, in the version that you just saw last night too, I, I actually needed to cut the film down. We had um, some Uyghurs that had been completely persecuted and escaped. What were, are Uyghurs? Uh, it's a spiritual organization within China that uh, people started to find their own freedom. And the, the Communist Party said, no, we're not going to have that. And it's millions of people strong. And it has its own issues too, but ultimately it was cultivating um, it, kind of a tai, tai Chi physical practice. Like the Fulang Gong? Yeah, very, 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 well, yeah, Fulang Gong is really the, the Tai Chi practice, but, uh, but, but the Uy Uyghurs had their own spirit, which was also spiritual principles. Which was also persecuted Totally too. persecuted. Which it, is it, fucking it, crazy it, because it, this is like the foundation yeah. of Chinese spiritual philosophy when we That's look right. at like the some of the great contributions of chinese culture it is tai chi it is fulang gong it is gong fu it is like these you know traditions that were like so fucking beautiful yeah yeah but it it was creating too much sovereignty for the people right and that because was because you're really sourcing the power from the divine from the field are. what is chi yeah, if it's right. not the universal animating life force of the whole fucking cosmos yeah so that became a big threat to the communist party and so these people have been persecuted tortured imprisoned everything you can imagine and i still get people today that will say you know it's really good in china and i know people who who live there who say it's really good and you can always find in any culture where there is master and slave, you can always find happy slaves. Because these are people who have been so beat down and they've lost the sense of themselves so much that they feel taken care of by master. And so they will report that they are happy because all they have to do is wake up, go work for master, and, go, and then have their little bread, 
crumbs, and then they go back and do it again the next day. And for them, that's a life. But there's a lot of us, the vast majority of us, that say, that's not the life I choose. I don't want to live in an open-air prison just because we're, everything's given to us. We, we need to be more, less surveyed, less reliant upon technologies, less reliant upon, I mean, totally sovereign, I would say, from any kind of government support, financial government support. We need to find a way to, to be completely sovereign in the way that we earn our living. Um, and that is one of the upsides to this entire situation, Aubrey, is, is that you, I, I love that you look at this perspective as one of the most challenging and wonderful times that we've uh, experienced here on this planet together, because I see it the same way. You know, it's horrific. It's scary. We are flirting with nuclear war right now. We are, we are kicking the hornet's nest of, of adversaries that would love nothing more than to end the United States. And we have a, an insane administration right now who is tempting them to do just that. Uh, we have all these things that are being pressed upon us. Our media is forcing us to look away from what uh, the traitors within our own nation are doing behind our backs right now. We're constantly shown some natural disasters, some war over here, some major celebrity scandal or something. It's a constant game of look over there so that you can't see what we're actually doing to your homeland. Mm -hmm. And so right now, as we all are so obsessed over Israel and, and Hamas and all the stuff that's going on, it all matters, you know, but here we are in our burning house, uh, gossiping about the neighbor's house burning across the street. Yeah. You know, when are we gonna, going to take care of ourselves? And that's, that's one of the main issues is that we have lost that, the focus on how important it is for us to, you know, real change, as I say, in the Great Awakening happens from within. And we're trying to move all the chess pieces out there instead of really doing the inner work and asking ourselves, you know, who are they really? And people ask me this question sometimes because I'll, I'll, I'll use the word they and they'll say, who are they? And I say, well, I can, I can name the names that are nameable, but the real they is us. Yeah, it's inside us. It's in us. Empire lives and yeah. empire lives in all of us. Yeah. And also the susceptibility to empire, which is our compassion. Yeah. We do care. We do want everybody to be taken care of. We do want everybody to have a bed and a home. We don't like seeing people, yeah. you know, homeless on the streets. That's probably what drew you to Bernie's campaign in the first place. You're That's like, right. I care about all people. I'm all in for all life. I want to help everybody. And that's the thing that actually I think these government agencies don't get is actually instead of weaponizing compassion to gain control, trust compassion like that we will naturally be compassionate and we'll want to set up systems that create a safety net, yeah. you know, like voluntary philanthropy will emerge when people are suffering and we consider them our neighbors. And we're like, wow, like these people are suffering. Let's donate to these, you know, food banks and these other homes to keep people like a little safer. Let's create systems. It's not the saying that's like, oh, well, you're out of luck. Fuck you, you know, starve mm -hmm. to death. We're going to let you starve. You know, like, no, we, we're going to want to help. We just will. We're naturally wired that way. But instead, they're weaponizing our compassion, which is something that Zuby said, which I thought was great. Brilliant. Weaponizing our compassion to actually get us motivated for daddy government to take control of us, which doesn't trust that people will take care of each other. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, Zuby helped me change a phrase that I had uh, been using for a number of years. I was saying weaponized morality, which it still is morality too. But when he said compassion, I, I said, yeah, that's, that's even closer to, to how they got me. Um, there's two, two classes that are most susceptible to these, uh, these agendas. And through the COVID experience, I had a lot of people that were debating with me, particularly when Plandemic One came out, because it was so early on, right after the pandemic was announced. And, and here we come out of the gate saying this is all something else. And I had a lot of people that were, um, they would get stuck at not understanding how, how does this system work? Because if you're telling me that all these doctors and people are in on some big nefarious plot, then you lost me. And I said, no, that's, that's not what I'm telling you the vast majority of them have no idea what they're actually in service to. Just like me when I was on the road with Bernie, I, yeah. I swore that I was in, I, when I found out that a lot of the protests and things that I've done through the years as an activist, and I was a radical environmental activist. I have a video of me on the front line doing undercover stuff with Jane Fonda, closing down banks and pipelines. And I had no, when I started to find out that George Soros was funding our protests, 
it spun me out because I thought, well, wait a minute, what? Why is he funding? I thought we were working against him. Why would he be funding what we're, our movement? What's happening here? Because all they want is discourse. All they, uh, I mean, all they want discord. D- 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 discord. All they want is conflict and and division. And uh, and so when I realized, you know, I started to talk with people after Pandemic One. Of you know, they would say, "My my brother is the smartest guy on the planet, man," and he is so taken by this narrative. I mean, we know we all have that, whether it's a brother in flesh yeah. or whether it's just a brother that we're like, "Whoa, bro, really." Yeah. Like, like you're going to come over for lunch and we have to sit outside and be six feet away? Right. Like, damn. And All these right. are highly intelligent people, right? Super so, intelligent. so that was always kind of a, a hard thing to figure out for a lot of people. And it was uh, Dr. Mark McDonald, who's also in The Great Awakening, that really helped me put the pieces together. He's a uh, psychiatrist. And, and when we had our very long, incredible interview, he's just a brilliant man, um, it really clicked for me because I realized, okay, there are two classes that they attack, and that is the deeply caring and the highly educated. And the highly educated are vulnerable because they've spent most of their lives in some form of government or pharma funded education. And they have been programmed to listen to professor, to listen to the authority figures. They know better, they they are the science. And so they've kind of surrendered their own sovereignty and, and, and critical thinking ability. And then you have the the I think the category that I would I would fall under, which is um, sometimes over emotionally attached to things, and so that I would react emotionally. I would hear this horrible thing yeah. happened, and and let's just let's let's go. That the warrior in me, the protector in me, would right. just charge instead of doing what I do now, which is uh, let me observe the situation, let me be the witness of the situation, let me look at all the intricate details of the situation to understand. Let me now explore the opposite side of it to find out, which is what I'm in the middle of right now with the Israel and Palestine situation. It's really digging into both sides to understand something that I don't even feel right to comment about until I really understand the dynamics of all of it. I think that's one of the issues is people are so quick to lend their opinions to things, um, which then become the seeds of a narrative that we find out later had nothing to do with reality. And it's an orienting identity narrative, That's which right. is one of the confusing elements of this is there's, <clears throat> if you're trying to spot, let's just call this force empire. Mm-hmm. Empire wants totalitarian control. Empire wants a pyramid. That's why, you know, empires, mm-hmm. well, there was a spiritual purpose originally for the pyramids, but why Ramses claimed and, and wanted to have a pyramid because he wants to sit on the top. He wants to be Pharaoh. There's a cult of the Pharaoh. Even the, <clears throat> even the Roman emperors, they had cults that would follow and worship and libate and serve the, the God, the deification, mm-hmm. which is what the ego wants. The ego says, there is no God, I am God. You know, and then like Yeshua would say like, yeah, you are God and so is everybody else. So it's like the ego versus like the true understanding of you know, our interconnectedness. But what is interesting is, is that force of empire that wants total control, it works through something like communism yeah. Right. Which is very clear. It's Mao or it's, you know, Xi Jinping or whoever, whoever is like at the top. Mm-hmm. But then it also works through these corporate forces mm-hmm. that want to just consume and extract and get the biggest profits possible. And it's interesting to see because one is a capitalist system, mm-hmm. you know, just run as a capitalist system did without enough controls. They've been able to capture a lot of government agencies. But it's odd because you see capitalism on one side creating this corporatocracy where all big pharma and big, you know, big pharma can dictate the health policies of the nation and clearly go in and manipulate people's minds and thoughts as we saw with the pandemic. And I'm just, you know, releasing today when this releases my own film, Unsafe and Ineffective, which shows that, you know, something that Lenin said, and again, the attributions to these quotes is, is always something you can look at. Do you fucking say this or not? But it's attributed to him. A lie told often enough becomes a truth. Yeah. And there was a lie, safe and effective, that was told often enough that people believed it was true. And now there's so much data that shows, no, nope, not quite safe and not quite as effective as they claimed it was, right. like clearly. But it's odd because we're seeing empire everywhere. And I think this goes back to the fact that empire lives within us. There's Mm -hmm. empire forces in unchecked capitalism and there's empire forces in rampant communism. And somehow there's like 
this kind of crazy handshake that's happening where the capitalist, big capitalist mm -hmm. forces, these corporate forces are becoming the oligarchs mm -hmm. that are all serving a greater oligarch, a greater, you know, emperor. Mm -hmm. And so they're creating a kind of pyramid. And so that's the way that it's kind of working together because it's, and it's interesting, but for me, what's the most helpful is just say, look, it's empire versus, you know, what I would call the, like the kingdom. And that's mm -hmm. from like the kingdom of heaven. Behold, I make all things new. And also yeah. there is going to be some structure. Like ultimately my opinion is we're going to need some form of one world collaborative government at some point. And we all know this. We watch a movie like Independence Day. Mm -hmm. Everybody comes together. There's an external threat challenging our whole planet. Well, it's probably not going to be aliens. I don't think they're going to come attack us. I think they're probably more sophisticated than that. But you, you imagine that there's a meteor coming or there's some existential threat. And we're right there. We're right there towards this Carrington event level of something mm -hmm. where we are going to need actual, genuine, global cooperation and collaboration. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be run different in a different way. There's a there's an organizing structure called holacracy, which is imagine yeah. imagine like King Arthur's table, the Knights of the Round Table, right? Where the king said, "I am equal to all of you. I'm not going to sit on a throne." Here's the Round Table, and mm -hmm. the Round Table could be as big as possible. It could be the United Nations if the United Nations wasn't captured and corrupt also by all the forces. And then each of them has their own Round Table mm -hmm. in their own country, and those Round Tables fractured off, fractured off, and then somebody from an underneath table always gets a seat at the table above. And so there's an organizing structure that I think does need to emerge at some point, which is to kind of steel man this, this argument for empire. Like we do need some form of global coordination in case of some cataclysmic event, which has clearly happened in our history. You mm -hmm. look at any of Graham Hancock's work and the meteor that melted the Greenland ice sheets and the rising of the waters mm -hmm. and, yeah, we're going to want to be kind of coordinated if that shit goes down. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be want to be kind of coordinated, but it's got to be structured in a different way, you know, and it's got to come from the appreciation and recognition of people's sovereignty and the base unit of that, which mm -hmm. is family. And then the family expands to community and the community mm -hmm. expands to county and the county expands to state and the state expands to nation and the nation expands to the United Nations and the United Nations expands to a healthy round table where there's, you know, some coordination. So I do see, I do see like, all right, this one world government agenda, it's not completely crazy. They're just doing it the absolute wrong fucking way because they're guided by empire rather than Camelot kingdom mentality. Well, uh, I will say that I think uh, for many years, I, I, I even signed off on thinking we need to open borders and we need to just unify with all of the other nations and start to work together instead of having these separate teams. Can we just join as one team would be the metaphor that I would use. And uh, as I've learned more, I'm on the opposite side of that now. I feel we need to go in the opposite direction. Total sovereignty of the individual, total sovereignty of every single state within the United States, their ability for us to choose. Mm -hmm. If we don't want abortion here and they want it there, great. Well, then move there if that's important to you. Let us choose what we choose as the people for the, the territories in which we live. I agree. I yeah. mean, I just want to be clear. I agree with that completely. And in my model, so the round table would have the max, each round table would have the maximum authority possible. Right. Your fucking self is the first round table. You're Arthur of your own fucking table. Do whatever you want with the sovereignty of your consciousness. How dare the government say you can't smoke weed or eat mushrooms? Mm -hmm. Fuck you. <laughs> right. Like, have the sovereignty of your own body and your own fucking consciousness. First round table. Second, your family. Don't you dare fuck with my family. Let me, let me organize my family. All right, mm -hmm. my community. You know, like, we want to go and create our own water and our phone. Don't you dare. How dare you fuck with that? But let's, let's elect people to another level that says, okay, what about the state? You know, what are we going to do with the state? What are we going to do with interstate commerce? What are we going to do with our public works policies? Which roads do we actually need? Which bridges do we actually need? You know, so state government, county government, local government, all the way up. And then, all right, states, all right, shit, we're in a country. All right, so what's our country government look like? Yeah. And it's not saying that we collapse all of that. It's like, it's like, it's round tables all the way up and all the way down. But sovereignty at every, at every level, at every piece. So it's built. Yeah. fundamentally in the structure 
to have sovereignty at every piece, but also some way in which when we do need to make larger decisions, there's a mechanism for that. I think if the, the collective mental health of humanity were in better shape, that structure would be amazing. But, it's yeah. the, but the fact that we have a, a very sick society with people who are um, in places of great power and they're operating through the filter of trauma at the, at the root of literally everything that's going on, I have come back to this common denominator, which is these people, I've done a, a lot of study on what are the archetypes of these characters? What makes Bill Gates want to have total control? What makes Klaus Schwab do what, he, do what he's doing? Um, George Soros and all these characters, what, what is this about them? And when you start to study who they were, how they were raised, particularly what kind of fathers they had or didn't have, you start to understand there's a, there's a commonality between these characters. And in some ways, it's revenge of the nerds. These are people who got shut out of society, didn't get laid in college, didn't have all the opportunities that other guys had. And so they went to a massive bunch of wealth and stuff. And when they discovered now in their 50s and 60s that it still didn't fulfill their emptiness inside, they're pissed off. And so now there's... Uh, there's an opportunity to to get revenge on the people to well they're they're purely they've pure they're pure ego pure it's it's totally because pure they ego. haven't like if they if they'd done you know a bufo ceremony followed by a few yeah. ayahuasca followed by a lot of time in the sex temples which of course empires destroyed through the religious context right mm -hmm. like a place where they could go and bathe in eros and connect to the divine you know they would be far different people and they would be looking to build this other system and create yeah. ways in which everybody from the bottom up had access to this field. It's the opposite of communism, which is there is no God. It would be like, no, 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 there is. And it, I don't care it's what name, I don't, I don't care yeah. what name you call yeah. it, but here are the ways you can find it through breath work, through Tai Chi, through Qigong, yeah. through, through all of these different, through psychedelic medicine, through ecstatic prayer, through all of these things, like they would have a different idea about how to build it. So that's you're right. right. It is. It's a fucking consciousness problem. That's right. Yeah. Years ago, when I, I've been studying anthropology and, and ontology since I was a kid, just fascinated by people and really fascinated because I love people. And I think that's something, too, that is dwindling out there that we need to revive our appreciation for being human and the and just the, the being curious about each other again and wanting to explore people that are different from us. We're all being wired that when someone's different, they have different ideologies, they're the enemy. Instead of what an incredible opportunity to learn about this person and perhaps about myself. And so it's, it's been years of just, which is why I even became a storyteller and a filmmaker. And um, I, I was never even a big fan of documentaries, but it led me here because it allowed me to sit with people like we're doing now for hours and to talk with very interesting people, people far smarter than me, uh, far more accomplished or people that have been through horrific situations and to, and to really find out like what, what is at the root of this thing we call human. And, and I've come out of that experience after doing this for 30 years, I've come out of that experience with understanding that, that if when I, when someone is raised properly, not, over coddled, not over complimented, but really shown what life is. Like I'm raising my boys right now. I have two extraordinary boys, nine yeah. and nine and twelve years old. You can you can feel it emanating off them. Yeah, thank you. And it's been a real, you know, consistent effort to bring them into everything that I've learned the hard way. And I give them a chance to learn the way they choose to learn. I always tell them, you can learn this through dad the easy way, or if you need to go out and experience the hard way, I respect that. You might mm -hmm. need to do that. I'm not, I'm not going to rob you from the experience of going out and feeling what pain feels like and what suffering feels like and what heartbreak feels like. You, you might need to experience that firsthand. I'm not going, going to, sh uh, to shield you and protect you from all the experiences that life has to offer. Because at the end of the day, ultimately, it is really about what we're experiencing in our day-to-day -day lives and, and how do we optimize that and how do we um, how do we create a foundation for other people to recognize that they actually do have the ability to create the life that they choose? Because I think we've all been lulled into this uh, this follower mentality for so long that there's some and, and so sedated, too. so so sedated, so so cynical, so resigned. 
And that's what creates this slave mentality, that you'd reach a point where you just go, look, it's, it's too hard on my own. So if the government wants to come in, and, and I saw this happening during COVID, a lot of people that I interviewed that would just start praising the fact that they got a few thousand dollars a month and they got to play video games all month. And they're like, this COVID thing, man, I don't want it to end. It's kind of cool. And I'd say, be very, very careful. That's the drug dealer in the corner saying, first one's free. So yeah, you go, hey, it's, it's man, bread this, and circus. Yeah, exactly. And it feels good. I like this. Give me a little more. Okay, well, this one you have to pay for. Not much, though. Until you're addicted, then it's like the price goes up and the drug wears out and you have to do a, a more deadly drug, a more deadly drug until you're finally destroyed. And that's how the system works. It wants everyone dependent, desperate and dependent. And when people are desperate and dependent, then they will look to the authority figure to lead them. And they will be happy when someone comes along and says, you do nothing except for the work I tell you to do, and I'll give you just enough to survive. And there are people that are actually happy with that because they don't know what they're capable of. They have forgotten. And that's why I say at the end of the Great Awakening, we have one major thing to do that I see, in my opinion, and that is to remember. We have been, there's a collective amnesia that's very dangerous that we're all infected by. And that's forgetting what we knew as infants, what we knew as toddlers. There's a reason that babies often look into the eyes of an adult and have that connected moment where they start kicking their legs and they get excited because they recognize the thing that becomes a t-shirt slogan for us later, which is, you know, we're all one and we talk this game, but we don't mm -hmm. treat each other like we're all one. We turn on each other really quick. We destroy each other if, if someone becomes a threat. We don't treat each other like we're all cells in the, in, the, in the same organism, fighting for life and celebrating life. But as children, we knew that. And we knew that everything was possible. And we knew that I came here not just to be a maintenance worker of a bunch of crap that I don't need, but I came here to, to participate in this experience we call life and to bring all of me. And I play a very vital role in this experience. And I need to, my, my hero's journey is finding what that role is and crystallizing it into something useful so that this experience evolves and the next people who take on that baton are that much more advanced. That's my job here. Mm -hmm. And instead, what we just do is we'll just sit back and resign, let somebody else take care of us. And we lose that through just the repetition. You mentioned, you know, the, the, the say it enough and it becomes true. It's unfortunately accurate because they've heard for so long that we are a failed experiment, that we are a cancer on this planet, that we are a parasite. And you have people of the movement that I escaped from that cult, you know, that that was a common narrative was just how horrible we are. Yeah. We would be better. This planet would be better off without us. And this is and where you get deadly. In, That's where you get into this transhumanist movement, which right. is like, we're going to plant things in people's brains. We're going to control them all. Humans are ultimately corrupt parasites, you know, mm -hmm. the, the problem, you know, they, and it's, it's funny because they're also what you, what you mentioned is people imagine that they're just like twiddling their fingers, like, ha, 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 we're going to do this. But they're actually, connect, they're actually infected by the virus themselves. That's right. They actually because they can't connect to the field of goodness, the field of value, the mm -hmm. field of God, whatever you want to say, mm -hmm. they can't connect to the actual field. They are actually projecting something that's coming from within them, with is, which is a deep self-loathing, mm -hmm. this feeling that they cannot be loved. They are not worthy of love. And it's like a manipulative controlling relationship. Just bring it back down to the simple roots. Like right. in a manipulative, controlling, abusive, emotionally abusive relationship, what does one partner do? They isolate their partner from all their friends. That's like classic manipulative relationship behavior. You start to isolate the person from their family, from their friends, or a cult, mm -hmm. or a cult. What does every fucking cult, real cult do? They start to say, don't talk to your friends, don't talk to your, don't talk to your family. We're the only people you can talk to, and there's somebody at the top who is the supreme leader. So cults are like little mini communist experience experiments yeah. where it's like, don't trust anybody else. No one can be trusted. Only these people can be trusted. And then people have this sense, oh, I'm, I'm belonging. I belong to something else. But they define themselves as belonging by putting somebody else on the outside of the circle and creating this pseudo intimacy, you know, like there's nobody else out there, but it's all coercive, manipulative behavior, which comes from the fact of you don't need to do that. You yeah. know, like you don't need to tell people to stop 
hanging out with their friends or seeing their family if you know that you're worthy of love like yeah fucking go for it go on that girl's trip you know go hang at this fucking place yeah great fantastic because you know that you're ultimately irresistibly worthy of love mm -hmm. and someone's going to love you and if that person doesn't love you oh well you know no no worries you'll find someone that does and i think these leaders have just played this out to such a level where they don't feel that they're worthy of love that they have to say well the only way someone's going to love me is if i control them mm -hmm. the only way they'll stay with me is if i control them yeah that's right and and so this mentality you can see it fractal all the way from the top down mm -hmm. to the bottom we are at war the people on this planet are at war there's been for for decades we have been, there's an assault on our nature. You can say an assault on nature itself, absolutely, but really an assault on our nature. And there's a reason for that. And you spoke into this at the very beginning of this podcast when you said that there's nothing that we will ever do or create that is more brilliant than nature itself. You said something along yeah. those lines. And that is incredibly accurate. There's nothing that we will create that will surpass. Now we can look at AI and go, oh, it's smarter than us. I'm not talking about surpassing our intellect. I'm talking about the system that we are a part of. We will emulate it through biomimicry, hopefully more and more. You know, biomimicry is a very, very important tool for us to start looking at more instead of us trying to uh, recreate our own nature and disrupt our nature to really look at it. How does it work? How, how, do, how, do, how do the seasons work? And how do the insects and the animals? And How and, does the mycelial network connect it's, the forest it's together? This un, is like Paul it's Stamets' unbelievably work. It's unbelievable. Brilliant, brilliant. And when you understand that we are just as brilliant of a system, the forest within us, and what connects us, we can understand, we can look at our technologies and have a whole theory around technologies that we create. I actually believe that we don't invent anything. We are given visions of a map to that ultimately helps us better understand ourselves and then we 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 create it in, in the physical world and we call it an invention but it's an outpicturing of us trying to understand ourselves so I'll, I'll tell you what i mean by that so when we first created this thing called the pc personal computer it didn't do much it was a paperweight and we could maybe put a new floppy disk in and make it do a little bit more, but it was a word processor. It could play Frogger. Um, it could, which was very important, and Pac-Man, yeah. which was um, very useful for a generation. And, but what happened was that, for me, I, I see that as us trying to take this little thing we call brain, mind, and put it out on a table as a prototype like an architecture architect might do and look at it and go, what? let me try to understand how this operates. And, and so essentially... It could only do what the factory installed on it, unless you put a little bit more, like read, you read a book, that's like putting a floppy disk in and, and, the, and the word processor learns a little bit more. Um, and then we create this thing called the World Wide Web, the internet. And we plug that little useless computer in and it becomes a supercomputer. Access to infinite intelligence. I believe that that is us trying to understand what the next possible evolution for us is is us plugging in you've mentioned psychedelics there's many ways that we've we've reached these through through i i i am grateful forever for the work that i did i don't do psychedelic work any any longer um but i spent seven and a half years in all over the world traveling with a shaman and doing very intense ayahuasca ceremonies and and watching people all over the world no matter what um culture they were from their age, have their, their intellect level, having a unified experience. If we were on the top of the Andes, deep in the jungle, or at a, on a skyscraper in New York City, there was a very unified experience. And that's why I've come to this conclusion that it's about remembering, because what people would do was remember. You've seen it. Mm -hmm. I've never seen somebody come out of a, a truly well-held psychedelic ceremony and say, I just learned that I'm disconnected from everything. No one says that. They say, I just learned that how divine my life has unfolded. I'm not too old. I'm not too fat, too short. All these things that I was holding in my mind, the perception of myself, none of it's real. And I'm connected to you the same way our cell phones are energetically connected. I can dial up your frequency and we can have a communication. Or I can dial you out and ignore you. Mm. And when people, so all these inventions coming back to that full circle, I feel that these are ways for us to look at what, what, what our natural 
systems are capable of doing that we don't do enough of. We don't, we, we communicate through our caricatures, through our facades, through the identity of Aubrey and the identity of Mickey, instead of like meeting at that place where we recognize the brotherhood, the, 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 the how we're identical twins in humanity in, mm. in so many ways, and that we are literally cells in the body of God. And the moment we start to war with each other, then we have disease, just like it happens in the, with the cells in, in our body. And if we can come back to that remembrance, that simple yet profound remembrance, and live our lives, let everything we do be informed by that and never forget. So I love that moment in the end of um, The Great Awakening when you know, David Martin comes in and talks about standing with bare feet on the ground and, and then remembering that moment of, of being totally human and never forgetting again. If we can remember, if we can allow these challenges that are coming up for us right now, and it's scary for a lot of people, especially people who have children. You know, I'm, I'm not, I, I have another 45 years left on this planet, but my children have 80. And what's their future going to be like? And all the future for all the children out there, particularly the ones that are being so damaged by these divisive medias that they have been, um, they hate themselves. Mm. They hate their country. They hate their parents. And they're all by design. If we can come back into just feeling the gratitude once again for the profound privilege of being alive, mm. of waking up and having these challenges face us, to know that they're actually calling us forth to do what we are supposed to do in these bodies while we're here. And all we need to do is stop for a moment and understand that the distractions are all by design. People now, when they have a free moment, it's scrolling. It's, let me fill my mind full of more data. We kind of need to go the opposite direction where we, let's, let's unlearn. Let's be silent and still for a moment. Let's go back in nature. Let's let the frequencies, there's, and, and literally there, there are natural frequencies that get blocked out of being in these concrete rooms that we can't fully um, soak up when we're not in the presence of nature. Mm -hmm. And so when we do that, I'm, I'm doing my best despite the fact that I'm an incredibly busy person, always juggling three or four films and other things going on, just like yourself but to remind myself how important it is, I'll actually say yes to things that I don't have time to do only because I know it'll force me to be in nature. Mm -hmm. I'm, yes, I'm gonna coach Little League because I'll have to be on the field with these young men thinking about something other than all the crap and politics and stuff that's, that, you know, that obsesses my life and sit there and be with these 12 little young men, nine years old, 10 years old, and, rem and have them help me remember um, to a deeper degree who and what I am. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, there's something in, in my own life that I've recognized is, you know, I've been studying a, a very particular brand of like the Solomonic lineage and in this, in, but in the general lineage of the Hebrew people and there's this idea of the Sabbath you know, Friday night at sundown, you know, mm -hmm. you have your Shabbat dinner and then you're on Sabbath until, you know, sundown again on Saturday. Right. And I was thinking about this and I was like, actually, even though like there's a part of us that's like oh, all these old traditions and, you know, I have my Jewish grandma and she was like, this is all nonsense. And like, mm -hmm. what are we even doing? This is, this is silly. It's outdated. It's this kind of impulse of like, well, yes, there are certain elements that are outdated and there are certain elements that don't make sense because the reason to do it is not because some God in the sky says that, you're, that, says that you should, but it's like the God that lives within you actually needs this, mm -hmm. like needs a moment to unplug from all technology. And I was thinking like, fuck, how good would that be for my life if on Friday when the sun went down, I just turned my fucking phone off and I didn't turn it on until... Saturday when the sun set again and I just had 24 hours to be with my wife to be out in nature to have a ceremony do whatever I wanted to do to just play or anything anything else but to completely unplug 
And I'm really like drawn to this kind of old, old technology, of course, reimagining it for this new context. They couldn't have imagined that actually how necessary it was to unplug from technology. You know, so they were talking about, oh, light switches and shit like that. We're like, no, I'm going to use light switches. <laughs> you know, like that's not the problem here. You know, it's not like yeah. the lights being on is not a fucking issue. I don't need to get a goy to turn the yeah. lights off and on for me. Like I'm fine with lights, but just shut, shut my fucking phone off right. for a little while. Like unplug for a little bit, restore. And then we're, we're going to have to enter the fray if we're going to be effective as sacred warriors yeah. in creating change. We're not going to get rid of the whole thing. This is not a regressive movement, but it's about how to take older traditions, concepts, ideas, and apply them to a modern context. Mm -hmm. And I've really become like reinvigorated about that idea because, again, the first unit of this roundtable model, this holacracy model, which mm -hmm. I think is ultimately the fruition it starts with the self like yeah. how do you get yourself back in the right residence how do you get yeah. your family back in the right residence how do you get your community back in the right res it has to start there and so you know this natural impulse to we're all one let's open the borders let's collect everything like no no, no. we got to look at our country as like an organ like imagine if our country you know the united states and of course there's lots mm -hmm. of people in other countries and i invite you to imagine your own country as this let's just say that we represented the heart Okay, the heart. So we're going to give and care and love and sometimes love fiercely, sometimes love tenderly. We're going to love the whole world, but the heart still needs to protect itself. Mm -hmm. And this idea, just open the borders, open the borders. We're creating a disaster. And yeah. I think there was something beautiful that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said, which was, I just saw him post this recently. Six months ago, I was like, open the borders. Anybody mm -hmm. who doesn't want to open the borders is xenophobic. Yeah. Anybody who doesn't want to open the borders doesn't care about the whole of humanity. But then he's actually gone down to the borders and see what's going on. Seven million people that have crossed. Yeah. And we have no way to actually support and care for them. And it's degrading actually our ability to function as an organ. It's like, yeah, sure. Let in the liver cells into the heart. Let mm -hmm. in the kidneys into the heart. Let, yeah. in the, let in the bone cells and whatever else. And it's not that livers, kidneys, or bones are not all so important, but let's allow ourselves the dignity and sovereignty to protect our heart so that we can actually serve the body of the whole organism in the best way. And so it is an act of actual love to actually say like, no, 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 we're going to be this. Now, of course, America has a lot of work to do to represent the heart, you know, and you yeah. can say, all right, we'll represent the brain, whatever, but yeah. whatever organ we are, we have a lot of work to bring our own organ of a country into functioning well within the organism. But if we're able to do that, I think it will create a ripple effect. I mean, I think we are a very... We're a very special country. And sure, we have our fucking flaws. You know, we have our problems. You know, there's lots of problems. You can find empire in so many places in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But if we're able to make that shift, and I think that's what Bobby Bobby's really all mm -hmm. about, is like leading a charge to make a fundamental shift. Be the ones that tell the truth the most. Yeah. Be the ones that are the most honest. And then clearly we have the resources and capacity to help the world we created a few trillion dollars out of thin air to lock the country down, which then siphoned a lot of money into the super wealthy corporations yeah. and took a lot of money from the middle class ultimately mm -hmm. and is continuing to take money through the process of inflation. Mm -hmm. But it would have cost a fraction of that to just say, you know what, we as, we as the heart nation, we say clean water for the whole world and we're going to employ people, you know, to actually go out and put in all of the clean water, you know, tools, the the septic systems, the wells and whatever. Mm -hmm. I think the, like the World Food Bank or organization, I forget which organization estimated it was going to be like 200 billion clean water for the whole world. That's like 1 20th of what we spent to mm -hmm. just lock down our own fucking people mm -hmm. for no good reason. It had no positive effect. You look at the correlations of people who locked down and didn't, same shit happened. You know, yeah. they're six feet away, wear a mask, lock people down. Did nothing. Negatively. Negative, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then the psychological damage and oh, trauma. Yeah. And, yeah. But just the wasted opportunity. It was like, oh, we had all of that money all along? Yes, that's right. So what good could we do with that? It, it, it reveals a lot. And then if we started funding policies to actually help people with this new story of remembering instead of coerce people into getting a pharmaceutical product, yeah. but actually like, 
listen, remember, these are the things you can do with breath. Like we put out, you know, international coalitions to say like, all right, remember how to connect with your breath. Old, old traditions. Again, going back yeah. to the old traditions, pranayama. How do you use your breath to affect your consciousness and your nervous system? How do you use this to, to actually move through life mm -hmm. in a different way? There's so many cool things we could do mm -hmm. with the resources we have, with the capacity we have. And it's just, that's, I think, really our destiny is to, is to step up, you know, from each level, from the individual all the way to the state, to the country, yeah. and really lead and actually find a positive channel for this compassion. I think right. the impulse to compassion is a beautiful, beautiful thing. It just needs to be channeled in ways that are going to affect the world in a positive way. And it's not, it's not going to look exactly like you think. It's not going to be just hand out this money. It's going to be about building structures and building stories mm -hmm. that can help guide this whole life into a different, into a different outcome. So the question that comes up for me then is what is missing within the recipe of, of humans that is prohibiting that from being our, our natural pursuit? Like why, why are so few people really going after their life's purpose and looking bigger instead of just trying to get a job and trying to, you know, their goal is which is an admirable goal, maybe buying a home or having, you know, some physical items that bring you security. But beyond that, what's really going on? And um, you've mentioned two subjects that I have been uh, obsessed with forever. And that's, you've mentioned them several times, and that's ego and God. And it really warrants a, a, a real discussion about the, for me, ego emerges in the absence of God. And I've been all over the place. Or at least ego takes supremacy in the absence of God. Absolutely. Ego is checked by God. Yeah. <clears throat> so I was raised with no religion. The only time I'd ever been to a church is for weddings and funerals. And I'm grateful for that because I had nothing forced at me. Right. My only... Which makes you allergic to God. When if you're forced into a religion that you know oh, doesn't make makes sense. You rebel against like it. when I moved to Texas, oh, yeah. when I moved to, I, so I was in California yeah. and, and I want to go right back to your thread. Sure. So don't lose it. I won't. But I was raised in California. Again, I had a Jewish grandmother. We lit some candles for Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. You know, that was pretty much the fucking extent of it. She was only there for Hanukkah once every two years or something like yeah. that. You know, I didn't get bar mitzvah. I didn't do the whole, I didn't take the whole ride. Right. Then I moved to Texas. And they're like, come on this ski trip. And I'm like, cool, I'll come on this ski trip. It wasn't a fucking ski trip. This was a fucking Bible camp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what the actual fuck are you guys talking about? Right. You know, and so, and then I saw people just suffering deeply as our own sexual bodies started to come online and the people who were indoctrinated into mm -hmm. sex is shame and the body is evil and, you know, all of these different things are sinful at the very least. Mm -hmm. And how wrecked they were, you know, like like girls who would lose their virginity to a guy and then the guy would immediately go like, you you know, you seduced me, you're the devil, you know, how mm. dare you, you fucking slut. Like mm. I'm like, and they would just be wrecked. And that was their first experience. And I was like, fuck this. I'm going straight Christopher Hitchens. Yeah. Like God is not great. Let's fucking tear this whole thing down. So I had like an allergy to the divine. And I think these corrupted institutions, which is just another arm of empire where everything rolls up to the yeah. Catholic empire, everything rolls up to the chief Brahmin, everything rolls up to whoever. They've been, they've taken the holy spark of there is the divine. Yeshua had some amazing things to share. Yes, right. You know, there's amazing, beautiful sparks in all of the religions. Well, all of every them. tool can be used as a weapon. Yeah. So, so people, so, so where, what I'm getting at is, I think there's an allergy that comes from when you receive information that's corrupted, you know, corrupted yeah. the divine impulse, then you're like, fuck the divine impulse. That's right. And so both you and I had the actual liberty of that not being indoctrinated in that. So we weren't allergic to God when we went to go find it ourselves. Now I had a mild allergy, but the mushrooms and MDMA cleared that up pretty quick. <laughs> well, something actually did occur when I was very young that did, that did have me develop that allergy. And then as an uh, aunt and an uncle who became born again Christians. And I will, looking back now in retrospect, I can say, I understand now what their mission was. Our, their mission was to save our family, which really needed it. And unfortunately, 
them trying to convert everyone had them uninvited to any family functions. Sure. And so as a young boy, I saw this and I thought, what happened to Aunt Judy and Uncle Don? Oh, uh, they're always trying to talk God and Bible. And so we don't want them to come to Thanksgiving. And so I made a decision in my mind, my eight-year-old mind, oh, this Christianity thing is really bad. That's how you lose family. Stay away from it. So I developed that um, through witnessing what happened to my aunt and uncle. And, uh, and then I spent many years fascinated by religions, read the Old and the New Testament, started studying Taoism, Buddhism, really connected with, uh, first it was Buddhism, really found that was the first time I went and meditated with monks that I had an experience of like, oh, I feel the likeness of being. I feel this, like there's, there's something here. And the monk said something to me that, that I'll, I'll never forget. I knew when he said it to me, the first time I went and sat in meditation with monks, the only thing I remember was he said, resistance is the cause of all suffering. Mm. And I remember driving home in LA traffic going, resistance, no, that can't be right. All suffering, really? I don't know about that. And the next thing I know, ah, I'm honking at the five o'clock traffic. And I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute. Here I am suffering, making my drive home something painful when I know there's going to be traffic every single day in LA at five o'clock. <laughs> Yet I'm fighting it, I'm resisting it. And I suffer every day that I, that I do that. This is what he was talking about. And then I started to look at every area of my life where I would feel either extreme or just a very subtle suffering. And I would realize, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm resisting what is. I, 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 my mind is telling me this shouldn't have happened, mm -hmm. but it did. So how much better would I be and how much quicker could I heal and move through these things? You know, brother dying, mom dying 36 days later. It was a big thing for me at 23 years old to deal with that. Yeah. My mom was my absolute best friend. But how much quicker could I have moved through that if I would have under, really understood uh, what we're talking about right now? Circling back to the ego God situation, um, having not been had that f force fed to me at a young age, I'm grateful for it, just like you. Because while I went all over the map, I actually became a, a, a an atheist at one point because a lot of the very brilliant men that I was following were atheists. And I thought, well, if they're that smart and they're atheists, they must know something I don't know. And so I adapted to that for a while. I became a nihilist. I created a, a term that I used to say to everyone. I used to say, we're just moss on a rock, just fungus growing on a rock, trying to make sense out of it. It means nothing, man. Just, just do your thing. I believe that wholeheartedly. And then I started to watch the deterioration of some of these atheists that, and I realized, oh, this shit has a shelf life. Mm -hmm. Because when you think there's nothing above you, and there's some atheists that get that there's something above them. They, and for me, it's like, well, they don't want to call that God. I understand. Because the dogmatic, the, the judgment that comes with it, the traps that come with that, I get it. Um, and then there's some atheists that don't believe there's anything. And those are the ones that started to deteriorate. I watched their logic start to shift. I, you know, for instance, you look at someone like Sam Harris, who I used to just admire deeply. And he went out full totalitarianism, you know, with COVID and shaming everyone for not getting the vaccine and follow the science and, and couldn't believe that people would even hesitate to put an experimental medication in their, in their bloodstream. He couldn't believe it. And then when the information came out and he started to realize it, he's been called out many times on it. And his ego is so huge that he won't say, I was wrong. Yeah. You know, that's the one issue I have with Trump, right? Just say you're wrong, dude. It's okay. Yeah. Just say, hey, warp speed wasn't what I thought it was. I, I was surrounded by sharks that wanted to do me harm. I made a wrong decision and um, I will do better next time. Cool. We can all, there, there's something liberating in that. When I came out and, and, and uh, did a reversal on my support for Bernie in 2016, yeah, I got some shame, got some death threats. The left turned on me immediately, fiercely. But ultimately, once I went through that, my skin was thicker and I found this sense of liberty, speaking the truth, the truth shall set you free. And it did. I just felt like I can just, I've been canceled already. So yeah. I don't have to worry about losing my job or having whether people like me or not. I'm just going to be honest. I'm going to go at all times come from love. But if that, as you said, love can be fierce. And if that love hurts you um, because it's truthful, that's your experience, not mine. Right. And so coming full circle into realizing, um, because I'm even watching, I'm in the, kind of in the middle here where it's like there's extremism on the left that's really deadly and there's extremism on the right that's really deadly. 
And I'm kind of in the middle here going, I get it. I get what these people really want. And there's a lot of great doctors that I'm dealing with right now that I've been, you know, top scientists in the world that are struggling mentally right now. And I had to, I started to counsel some of them to get involved mediating some of the wars, the infighting that was happening to try to figure out what's going on. I don't want this to fall apart. I've been part of a lot of movements and I've seen them crumble. It always begins with infighting. It's like, we are one, we are one team. And the next thing you know, you go, I don't know about this Aubrey guy. I don't know. I don't like, did you hear what he just said? Did you? I was a big, you know, uh, fighter for Standing Rock. And I remember I was in a hotel room, 30 degrees below temperature. And we had this team of media people that were go going to, you know, keep exposing Dapple and, and win this for the Lakota people. And uh, we were all in a production meeting one day and, and, and everyone was, you know, engaged in the conversation. And there was one young man that was sitting there, not fully engaged. And he looked at his phone at one point and he looked around at everybody and he looked really suspicious. And then something kind of confidential was spoken and he got up and ran out. And someone goes, I knew it. He's a plant. And everyone went in this full story that this guy, I, you know, it's like, look at his attitude and look, and they went to this paranoia. And I went, oh, man, I've heard this before. And it's, it's almost never accurate. Yeah, like so everybody, everybody's him. a false flag. Yeah, everybody's, everybody's a control Everybody's opposition. a plan. Everybody's a control. Yeah, exactly. I chased this kid down the hallway before I got in the elevator. And I said, hey, Mark, I said, there's people in there that think you might be working for the bad guys or what's going on. You were acting a little strange. And he showed me his phone. He goes, I just found out my girlfriend's cheating with my best friend. Fuck. That's what was happening for this young man. And they almost threw him under the bus and they were going to come after him. And I had to go back in and say, you guys are totally wrong. Stop being so quick to throw people under the bus and turn on people. We're not going to agree about everything. We're not always going to behave the way that you prefer. And so in-, in You made a in, great video about that, by the way. Our birthright. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. And I made it just for this reason, because I was, I, I was watching the entire thing start to collapse with, you know, people that were in my films. Judy Mikovits was angry at this person. And then Robert Malone was being attacked from all these angles and all these people that I know intimately. They've stayed at my home. They're my friends. And I'm watching what the world is saying about them. And I'm watching what the world said about me. You, you know, when they say it about you, you know, whether it's true or not. And, you know, there's memes out there calling me a domestic terrorist and thinking of terrorist for trying to reveal what's happening to, to, you know, potentially better our lives and that somehow terrorism. Okay, cool. Um, but the thing that I think is missing is the understanding of this. And you, you get this because I know we've been in a lot of settings where you've, I've heard you speak about this, but the mistake is to, is to glorify your own persona is mm -hmm. to, is to really think that it's me. It's Aubrey. And, and the metaphor that I like to use is this, imagine the stereo in your car convincing itself that all that incredible music that comes through, it created. Now the instrument is the radio and it's a receiver and a broadcaster. Yeah. And there are really cheap radios and there are really finely, finely designed radios. And the cheap one plays music at a very low frequency and, they, and the, and the well-tuned instrument plays it at a crystal clear, beautiful frequency that affects the body at a, at a higher and deeper rate. And so if you look at yourself, your instrument, your tuner, that finely tuned radio in your car deserves some compliments for being so well crafted. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the human body, all of the trauma that we've been through, overcoming the, the, the tragedies in our lives, learning from them, being a student of life, adapting the cliche that nothing happens to us, but happens for us, it helps us tune our instrument so we can receive clearer, more accurate, more life supporting information. And it allows us through the entire circuitry of that system, they call it a sound system. You know, the wires to the speakers matter. You have a cheap, bad, ungrounded wire and that speaker is gonna buzz. You have really well-made speakers that can receive that music that was inspired in a studio by a musician that channeled this beautiful art we call music, this poetry we call music, through the gift that they spent 10,000 hours learning their instrument, their voice, their drums, their mm. guitar, whatever it might be. And then now it can be reproduced through this receiver and broadcaster in crystal clear, perfect, perfect quality. We need to respect our bodies for the way that we have allowed them to be tuned that allows us to be 
solid, clear receivers. And that our system allows us to communicate in such a way that those words become medicine. Yeah. So that's the depth into which we should receive compliments. But we are not the music. Uh, the, 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 I mean, the radio does not make exactly. the music. It receives it and, and produces it. So all these doctors who are, have started struggling, I've been conveying this to them because I say, listen, I know what you're going through. Four years ago, you were a science geek locked away in a laboratory. Now you're signing autographs at airports. It's a lot. I've been in Hollywood for 35 years. I've seen what, it, what fame does to people. And it's usually not good. I've seen really, really good people get completely destroyed because they start to believe they are the character that, they're being, that, the, that the public loves. And, and they, when they see people fawning all over them, they think, I must be anointed in some way. Be, I, I must be that thing. Because mm. everywhere I go, people tell me this is the reflection they're showing me. And when the moment you buy that, that's why I said God and ego, that's when the ego kicks in. And that's when it becomes very detrimental and might serve you for a short period, but there's a shelf life to that and it will expire and you will see the other side of that sword, that double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. And so the only way for me, because I see a lot of stuff, I see footage from Afghanistan and all over the place, from Syria, the stuff that gets blurred out on the news, we, we, ha we see it before it gets blurred out. And people always ask me, how do you stay so positive? And it's understanding that I don't, and, I, and it, this, this is not something I always practiced. And if, if I were still in that as a 35 year old man with my old beliefs, the work I do now would destroy me. Mm -hmm. But all it does now is give me gratitude. Yeah. Gratitude that I get a chance to do something about it and move the needle to, it might, might be a minute degree, but at least I'm moving the needle somehow. And yeah. it might be with one person, but at least I'm not causing harm. I'm doing something that I know is positive mm -hmm. and life supportive. And so, What's happened globally with, with humanity and particularly men is that we have lost contact with this thing we call God. And I often say the very thing you said, which is by whatever name you choose. And I speak at a lot of big events and mega churches. And sometimes I'll come off stage and Christians will be like, sweetheart, I loved your testimony, but there's only one name for God, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, I understand what you're saying and thank you. And thank you for standing for what you believe in. But I know as a, when I was a young person, if somebody would have told me that, that would have turned me away. I want to give people to find God the way I found God. And that was on my own. Yeah. And it's to know God. And, and, and I do now pray to Christ. And I never in my, Aubrey, in my, all of my years, if you would have told me that one day that I would even believe in Christ, because I thought it was just some fictional story. I understand now how profound most of the scripture is, and maybe all of it, sorry, but I, I'm, I'm, I need to find that truth for myself. And I'm still studying the scripture to find out what areas of it. I, I find it fascinating. There's so much in there that is prophetically coming true. The, like the, that, that inspired text is so important, but the understanding that there is a, a there's an intelligence and in some might whatever you call it nature. That's cool. That's what I, that was my stepping stone towards Christ consciousness was let me just call it nature. Cause I'm comfortable right. with that. No one's going to judge me by calling it the intelligence of nature. But now I actually realize there is something within this Christ consciousness and it informs me. And I had a profound, very profound Christ awakening in 2008. Um, and maybe I'll tell you that story one day. I call it my Jesus burrito story. Um, because it happened at a Mexican restaurant and I had to rush home and have this out of body experience that came out of nowhere, completely sober, no margarita, but it was actually, um, I won't tell the full story, but it actually tuned my system to what I now call the father frequency. Being raised with a mother, a gay brother and two sisters. I had, it was totally dialed into the, fe the to the female frequency, mm -hmm. to the mother it's frequency. Good place to start. It's a really great place to start. But I, but I rejected anything to do with the masculine and father. Yeah. And so I, what I didn't know at that time was I was about to have two boys. And so this was God saying, if you have boys under the condition that you're in right now with your rejection of the masculine, yeah. you're going to fuck them up. Yeah. So you need to clear that stuff out and let your daddy stories go and all the examples you've seen of bad dads. And you understand there's really something. You live on Mother Earth the frequency, and there's a Father God frequency too. And if you can balance those out, your life is going to improve. And all I can say is I've been with my wife for 21 years. 
and we have never had a real fight ever and that i credit her for that she's an incredible woman who just won't fight i tried for two years we first got together <laughs> until i finally one day said i just lost it i said i feel like i'm fucking shadow boxing she goes what i said i'm just it's me it's all me i'm fighting myself and she goes yeah yeah you are <laughs> so one of the things that i think this brings up for me is i loved your analogy of the of the radio and the and the frequency the one that i prefer myself is to think of ourselves as like a flute i play the yeah. native american flute and it was the first instrument i learned it was the first way i was able to express music you know i was always good with words i could write poetry and so it's a, it's a kind of music and it actually operates the same way because i think of myself like a flute and this flute has been crafted from wood that has been from the tree of my ancestors. It's like a flute from the tree of my own ancestors and my own DNA and my own. And it's been carved and the holes have been placed in different ways and the way that the fret is and the way that it's all built out. Like Aubrey is the flute. Yeah. But the flute doesn't play without the wind. Yeah. Without the wind. And the wind is the wind that comes from the divine. And when you're really playing and you really are into the music, you're not playing like spirit is playing through you. It's, mm -hmm. it's the actual wind that's moving through your flute that's creating the, creating the sound. Right. And so if, you're, if you reduce yourself to the flute, ah, oh, this, this flute, you know, and, and you're the one playing and you don't give credit to the wind that moves through you, every great artist knows that, knows that it's the wind. You can call it the muse, you can mm -hmm. call it whatever else, but you know that you step out of the way. Step out of the way and allow something to go through. But it doesn't mean that you completely disclaim all the work it took to make this flute, the work from your ancestors, the work mm -hmm. from yourself to create a beautiful flute. And it's always the wind. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have some access to the wind, and I think this goes again to what, you know, my criticism of the Christian movement would be, which I think there's a lot of beauty. People have fused their adoration for Jesus, which was the flute, instead of the Christ, which mm -hmm. was an aspect and a quality of the wind. Mm -hmm. And so what he's really talking about is the Christ the whole time. He's talking about the Christ, not talking about mm -hmm. me, Jesus, the flute. He's talking about the Christ, mm -hmm. which is the father, which is, the, which is that masculine principle, that universal love that's actually blowing through the flute. So when you're talking about, you know, and, and I really appreciate that when you're talking about Jesus, you're not talking about Jesus, you're talking about the Christ because mm -hmm. that's what Jesus was talking about, really mm -hmm. talking about the Christ, that Christic consciousness that's within us. And so if you fuse everything to adoration of the flute, you miss the point. The point was that he was always pointing to the way, the truth, the light, which is the, which is the wind that just happened to go through a very incredible man. And all credit, all credit to mm -hmm. Yeshua, you know, for being the flute that could hear and play, you know, the, the, the song that he ultimately played. And so people will say, you know, Jesus is the only way. And I'll go, okay, thank you. You know, love Yeshua. I've had my own Yeshua experiences where he embodies, he is able to embody mm -hmm. that Christic consciousness. But if I hear someone say, you know, I'm a follower of the Christ, I'm like, fuck yeah, me too. Yeah. The, fuck yeah, absolutely. You know, Christ, Christ is an important frame, an important way, and an absolutely inexorable energy that we can tap into. I absolutely but I don't fuse that with the man. I give all credit, like mad respect. And if there was one human being that I could spend five minutes with, like there was, some, there was a meme that came out. was like, would you rather have $5 million or five minutes with Jesus? Like fucking five minutes with Jesus. Easy one. Yeah. For sure. I want to talk to Yeshua. Like it's invaluable. And immediately I would ask him, what's your sex life like? <laughs> like that would be my first question because that's another element that I think has gotten twisted. I think eros this uh -huh. natural connection this polarity that we have with people and if you're if you allow yourself to take that deeper there's a way that you find the divine in the union in the hieros gamos in the in the blending of those polarities and so that's the part that i think has been redacted from the document and there's been a lot of work in the gnostic faiths and a lot of more imaginal realms where they place magdalene back in this position of power and their union and their hieros gamos and their sacred tantric work which opened him up to this possibility whether that's true or not i'm sure there's parts of the story that we don't know and yeah. it's led to this whole shaming of the mm -hmm. body and this original sin concept which 
I categorically reject. This is how life works. Mm -hmm. Life works through the blending and the union, the zivug, which is the Hebrew word, the Aramaic word for this, the union. Mm -hmm. And to really celebrate that as well as part of this, as part of this impulse, as the Christic impulse moving yeah. its way through also this third dimension density right. and creating mm -hmm. this spark of energy, which is so powerful. It's like a little big bang when the egg and the sperm meet, there's a little flash of light that comes in a and a new being is born from this. It's incredibly mm. special and powerful and beautiful. And so we got to bring that back with it as well. Right. So, I mean, I think it's, it's really beautiful how you talked about, you know, and when I'm hearing you say the Christ, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I fucking, I'm with you. I'm with you Christians, you know, just, yeah. just call it the Christ. And like, you got me, you got me on board, you know, I'll sing a hymn. I'll fucking, yeah. I'll do the, I'll do the whole thing. Like I'm, yeah. I'm totally into it. And, I think one of the things, this leads me to another part that I want to talk about. And of course, you can comment on what I just said too. But one of the things in Great Awakening that you talked about happened in China is they tried to neutralize all the polarity. That's right. They tried to actually androgenize the entire population, like literally. Everybody right. had to get the same haircuts. Everybody had to wear the same clothes. Mm -hmm. And they tried to de to depolarize, not in a way of the polarization we see in the country, left, right, blue, red, you know, all mm -hmm. of these things, but depolarize the fundamental structure of relationship of union yeah. and collapse that erotic energy. So without that erotic energy, you're looking for some way to connect. That's you're right. looking for some type of zivug union. And the only zivug that's available because you can't find it in relationship is zivug with the state, is union with the leader and the higher that's principle. That's exactly right. And so, and we're seeing that happen in our own fucking country also. These forces that are looking to actually androgenize the population. What is a man? What is a woman? Men are women. Women are men. Men that's can right. give birth. Men can menstruate. There's tampons and male bathrooms. What, what is that for? We are in a cultural revolution right now. And yeah. that's what Ma Mao Zedong called it. And that's how they were able to corral 1.4 billion people into the structure that the people are still trapped in right now called communism. Um, through, through a cultural revolution. So here in the States, we call it a culture war. And so we are at a cultural revolution. What is our culture? And I want to ask you this. What are three things that Aubrey Marcus would live and die for? Hmm. It doesn't have to be the top three, but three things that you would live and die for. The people I love. Okay, for love. For... For mom. Mom. For mom, which I mean, not like my mom. I love Kathy, you know, my mom. And I would die for her. And, and maybe she would die for me first, though. So it would be, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't actually She's serve an her. She's awesome woman. I love her. It, too. Wouldn't, it wouldn't actually serve her. So, but I'm talking about like, like Gaia, Sophia, like the yeah. earth, like, like the real mother. Okay. I'd die for the mother. Okay. And, you know, I'd die for the, I'd die for also the, the principle of the father, which is story, which is truth, which is value, which is beauty, which is, mm -hmm. which is, which is God in many ways. God, mm -hmm. I think is a blend of the mother and father, but like all of those things, which includes our freedom, which includes our joy, which yeah. includes our bliss, which includes our eros, which includes all that. Right. So, um, it would be, you know, love, love for the mother and then for that the father principle for the, for mm -hmm. a greater story that would play the infinite game right. on this, on this plane. So if everyone that's listening to this podcast, asks themselves that question, I pretty, really appreciate your vulnerability in that too. Um, that those, I guarantee that if it, everyone makes a list, three things, 10 things, whatever it is, I guarantee that all of those things are under attack right now. When they can attack everything that's, worth li living and living and dying for and they can take those things away then they they own us what has sent men to the front line of every battle to defend their world has been love ultimately love for their country love for their families love for their wives their children whatever it might be so everything you, you that you just mentioned there is can be encapsulated in this th thing called life yeah. This experience called life, freedom, creativity, the mother, the father, birth, 
death, all of it. Like this is the essence of what is most important to us. And this is exactly what they are attacking. And when I say they, I want to be very specific here. Because as you mentioned earlier, it's a, almost everyone is just following. They don't know they're following. They don't know they're hypnotized. They don't know that they're just bowing. This is the, that's the area of religion that I, I think has caused damage is this propensity to um, succumb to fear, blind faith, and obedience. Mm -hmm. Very dangerous um, to, when it becomes extreme, I should say. When you looked at what Mao Zedong did and how they were able to really coerce that number of highly intelligent, very disciplined people, Chinese people are, you know, stereotypically intelligent and very disciplined and honorable people. And so to take away their attraction to each other, to make the women shave their heads and look like boys, and to remove that natural tendency to procreate, to create life, to create family. And I know you've had an incredible life and experience, but brother, when you bring children into this planet, if you think you know what love is right now, mm -hmm. I thought, I, I mean, I, I'm a love child born in the summer of love. I thought I, I knew what love was until I had children. And I went, holy shit. It's one thing to love another. I've been in love many times, but it's another thing to love what you've created as another. It's, it's a love that is, is ineffable. And so to, if you look at all of that, our next generations are being so terrorized by false agendas, namely climate terrorism, that they are vowing to never have children, to never have a family. Why would you if you thought the world was going to end in eight, eight years? How irresponsible would it be to bring a child in and by the time they're eight years old, life's over and they have to experience the trauma of Armageddon? Why would you do that? That's, those are the narratives that are set up to stop us from procreating, to stop us from creating life. All the while they give us these narratives about overpopulation. That is one of the biggest lies ever told. On this planet, 29% of it is land. The rest is sea. 7% of that is uninhabitable. It's high desert, Arctic, whatever it might be. So what does that leave numbers wise? 20 some odd percent of inhabitable land here. We currently occupy one to 2% of that. But they want us crammed into these smart cities where we can be totally surveyed and totally controlled instead of teaching us how to go out and homestead, put our hands in the soil again, grow our food. Why in some states within the United States do they m make it illegal to capture rain? Are you kidding me? Is that, is that for real? It's for real. Places in, in Colorado and, and or they limit it. You can have 40 gallons, you can capture 40 gallons, but that's it. Well, I, I remember as an environmentalist years ago when I learned this, I, I, I don't understand this. Why wouldn't they be saying everyone must capture urine because we're going to run into a water issue very soon. Oh, COVID revealed that truth for me. What did they do when you said, look at it, you cannot violate my constitutional rights. I'm going to keep my five generation family business open. You're not going to, I'm not going to let the government destroy it. They said, okay, we're going to cut off your water and power. They want everyone on the grid. And that's how they punished those. They couldn't do it through law because we have constitutional protection. They could do it through the resources that they own. And they own all the power, the water, and all these precious resources. So that's how they were able to force people, go ahead and open your doors. But you won't have any electricity. You can't cook. You can't use your stoves. You won't have any gas. You won't have any water. No bathrooms. Go for it. Good luck. Total control over the people. And that's why they don't want us out in the rural areas. And the last point I want to make on this is in our, in my obsession with trying to figure out from, from a position of, I believe we're all born good and something happens al along the way mm -hmm. that make men bad and some women too. What happens? What is the commonality? Is there something there that we can look at so we can avoid that and not necessarily allow that history to continue to repeat itself? And what I found is, is it, within these certain 
rare archetypes, 99% men, they have a very similar upbringing. They either have a very high-powered lobbyist, op, uh, um, uh, monopolizing father who was a you know a politician, a high-powered attorney, or some political lobbyist, or 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 you know whatever it might be. They had that to influence them. Watching daddy go after empire, and so they become that. Um, or they didn't get what they needed from daddy. And they're carrying that wound into their matured masculine form. And so what we found when we started to look at these characters and realize, no, this, you know, all these people, that they don't really, they're not consciously doing this. They actually think, just like Hitler thought, we, I, he's doing the right thing. There's an evil thing called Jewish people, and we need to eliminate them. He believed that. Most of the people that are behind these agendas today that are... Um, contrary to human survival are thinking that because we are a parasite it wouldn't hurt to lose a few billion parasites on this planet so we can actually take the good ones the ones that come from good bloodlines and they're wise and they're educated and to live with those people because we we align with them the elite for the, the elite families we align with them but all these other peasants we're now reaching an age of automation or we don't really need the worker bees anymore. It's a problem. What do we do with all these useless eaters, as they call them? And so what we discovered in, through this, my obsession of trying to figure out, just trying to, I want to figure out what these men are about, these men that are consciously at the helm of these agendas. What we discovered was the number of people that are consciously twirling their mustaches and truly meeting in boardrooms going, we need to get rid of a big deal of this population. Their numbers are far less than 10,000, probably closer to three to five. And I've had other people that know how to research, that know historians and, and have put the pieces together that have come to the same conclusion. And the numbers have fluctuated anywhere between five and 8,000, somewhere in there, but I always say less than 10. So we have less than 10,000 people dictating what 8 billion people can do and can't do on this planet. And if they, if they just revealed Epstein's client list, we'd be able to take out 25% <laughs> of them right there. You know, there'd Maybe be like the great, one of be, them. <laughs> it would be the great decimation. <laughs> it's of, true. Of, you know, that's, it's true. I mean, seriously. It's true. Like, that's one of those things I was hypothesizing. Like, what actually, what actually happens if that happens? Like exactly, a lot yeah. of these people who've, who've been, and that's where it gets interesting because those are the people who've, in, you know, in, in my tradition, we call it Sitra Akra, which is there's Panim or Panim, which is face to face with the divine, mm -hmm. like looking straight at, straight at God and saying, God, what do you want? And God looks back right at you and says, what do you want? And then you look back at God, what do you want? What do you want? And then you collapse your desire with the divine desire as close as you can. And, yeah. both, and it's a mutual relationship of trust and love. Like, I love you. I trust you. That goes both ways. Panim or Panim, you're looking straight straight face to face with God, which is goodness, value, ethics, virtue, good, the true, the beautiful, eros, all of that. And then there's the turning of the face where you know, actually, you're doing something. And sometimes your, your face is just turned and you don't know. But sometimes there's those people, and this is intentional malice, where you know, you're turning the face and you know that you're walking a path. That is, that is dark. And you may have your justifications and you may, I think a lot of people do, but those people who got on, you know, and went to, you know, fucking child slave island, clearly they're in the Sitra Akra category. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way that you can justify, you know, using these children as sexual objects is any way in accord with looking face to face with the divine. And so there is evil and intentional malice and right. but and there are the justifications and there are the things but it is i agree with you it's it's far less than we far less than we imagine but i mm -hmm. think it is there is a consolidation towards the top where a lot of people who do actually know that they're doing some fucked up shit oh yeah you know that does also exist it's just i think people imagine that it's everywhere and all over the place and every ceo of every pharma company is also evil and every every person like this every politician every, no 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 it's way too far 
you know, but there is just a, there's a small cohort that is intentionally turning their face from really opening their heart. I mean, their hearts have been closed. They're all brain yeah. and they're just looking at efficiencies and algorithms and making any justification and then creating a separation, a dehumanization, dehumanization of them and another person where the individual's life, again, going back to individualism versus collectivism, that these individual lives don't matter. I am, I am a demigod. These are, these are my, these are some subclass of humans. This was the, this was the idea behind slavery, like yeah. actual slavery in the first place. It was the like the, de of civilization. the dehumanization yeah. of a certain type of people. And you can make the argument that, all right, well, don't we do that with animals? I mean, we mm -hmm. eat, we eat cows mm -hmm. and we eat chickens yeah. and, and I eat cows and I eat chickens and I try to be a humanitarian where I want those cows and chickens to have lived the best fucking life possible, but I'm still going to eat it. But when you extend that all the way to humans, you're fucking lost. Yeah. You're like really, really lost. And I think people already know that with animals. If like someone started serving dolphin meat, you know, that's why dolphins save tuna. Everybody's like, yo, stop fucking killing dolphins. Right. It's interesting where we it draw, is, the, it, is it is interesting, interesting. where we draw the line. If, you it's, know, if it's cute and it's got a cute face. And then we can tell, yeah, if it's cute <laughs> or if it's ugly, intelligent <laughs> or like. But cows are cute though. I like cows a lot, but, uh, but I had a great steak last night. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But it's like, it's like this idea of like, oh, we're, we're the demigods. This is our food. Yeah. And, and they've, lost the, they've lost the plot. And that's where the sacred goes back to, goes back to life. There is a place where life consumes life, of course. Yeah. But there's an honoring of that life all the way through. And our First Nations people knew that. Right. You know, they didn't kill the buffalo thinking that the buffalo were just fucking no, here to serve. Yeah. They, were, they were here to serve us and they don't matter. And so my, might as well put them in a fucking factory farm and might as well do all of this stuff. And mm -hmm. And I think there's just an evolution of consciousness that rec recognizes like, all right, this is a consumptive life, death planet in a certain mm -hmm. degree. We have to eat life to produce life. And this mm -hmm. is part of the process and plants or animals or wherever they're going to be part of this cycle. But there needs to be a sacred honoring like all the way through yeah. if you're really going to be part of life. And you're also going to have to reconcile with the times where you have, and I speak personally for me, where I've gone citra okra with my food right there's a great restaurant here in town called uchiko and they make this seared foie gras sushi and it's so good bro it's so delicious and when i eat it and and i try to order it not anymore now because i know this and i'm aware of it but when i eat it i'm like this i'm turning my face from god because i'm going i'm eating torture right now i'm literally eating torture like these goose these geese are fucking held in a place where they can't move they can't and it's like fuck and so like there's also this recognition of we are empire too we we've also done things yeah. and participated in things because it benefits us we get a certain pleasure i get this explosion of flavor in my mouth and i'm like fuck that was good right they even have a wine that pairs with it and it's right. like but but i think like as as we evolve and as our goodness evolves that becomes actually like intolerable you're like all right this is where i can't i can't do this looking god in the eye yeah and saying you know thank you goose for your imprisonment and enslavement so that i could have this little moment of pleasure that's not in my goodness you know and i've participated in it and it's like so we're all we've all got a little bit of this in us and again so that that opens us up to yeah. just have a seat at the table. Like, listen, everybody, you know, some of y'all might need to go to jail, but nonetheless, like we're going to rehabilitate you through jail, bring you back to a state of goodness. We've all participated to some degree, whether it's you've eaten foie gras or you've done something far more heinous that requires that uh -huh. you need to go to jail. Either way, like there's a seat at the table. Again, the Christic impulse, yeah. like there is forgiveness that'll come from this greater awareness. Well, and like you said, where do we draw the line and who draws that line? Because we can have the same argument for for plants eating salads, right? Because right. we know plants are conscious, right? We know what happens when you talk to them. We science has proven that. So, is it you know at what point do we say this is what we're supposed to consume and and not this? I, I think I think it's, it's, it's like a, it's our relationship with the divine. I, I, and it, I it goes back too. to that. Like we have to be able to whatever choice we make, we have to be able to look God in the eye and say like yeah. God, I'm doing this. God, what do you think? And God's like bro, you're eating torture. And you're like, 
Yeah. I don't want to hear that God, la, 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 you know, and, and I think that's really, a, a, it's really where I stand. And that's where my policy is, is humanitarian. Yeah. Every, you know, it's not that I won't, if I'm out on the road and, you know, buddies are getting burgers from, you know, Shake Shack or some shit like that. And I know it's not grass fed and I don't know where the meat comes from. It's not like I'll never eat that fucking burger. Right. But I know some part of me is like, damn, damn, damn. You know, yeah. this isn't, this isn't actually me abiding in the goodness that actually wants to live right live through me so on the subject of food and 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 uh i've been talking about this lately because i got into this conversation with one of my editors and um and he's a real devout christian and and i i love him for that he's has more principles than probably any man that i've ever met and i will say this too i want to maybe put a cap on the Christian conversation because coming full circle now to actually understanding that there is a there there. Um, I will say since 2020 being deeply immersed on the front line of this fight for medical freedom, I have been truly profoundly amazed by certain archetypes of people. And the two that have, I have found to be the most humble servants to life are what I call mama bears, mothers who have had children injured by vaccines, sure. killed, and some fathers. Mama bears are fierce. There's nothing you could do to scare them. You've, they've already damaged or lost their baby, and their entire, the rest of their days are committed to saving other children and Christians. Out of all the people that I'm interfacing with, and, I, and I'm interfacing with people from all over the world, those are the ones that have been the bravest, the most committed, the most in true service. Because I had to even check myself. I, I, I felt like I've been in service for a number of years, but not until the past four years or so did I, was I able to witness how much of me was involved in the service that I was doing before that felt selfless, but was still to some degree glorifying my own reputation, making choices so I could be a hero instead of just making choices because it's the right thing to do mm -hmm. and letting the chips fall where they fall. And if that means I'm shamed and persecuted and whatever, let it be because I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to do what's honest. And, and, and I recognize that when we operate, my goal has really been, you know, purification of thought, purification of intention. If I can move into this without just seeing it as an opportunity because I'm going to do a favor for this person because they might fund my next film and just drop all that stuff that you learn in Hollywood. Everyone in Hollywood is an opportunity. You go to networking events and people are looking over your shoulder for somebody who might be able to help their career. Right. They're not with you. They're not, they don't care about you. Yeah. Human, the, the unique beauty of a human being is yeah. reduced to a function, which it, is it sociopathy. Really is. Yeah. Yeah. It, that has a name. Right. It truly is. And because their goal is just, I have to get here instead of letting their life's purpose unfold, it is, I'm, I have to get on a TV show. That's, that becomes their life's purpose and they'll never be fulfilled. They'll get there and, and they'll have the whole world of any drug they want and, and, and dark sex and everything will open up to them and they will take the bait and destroy themselves and spend the rest of their lives healing and un trying to undo the damage that was done by, by, by taking that lure. Um, one of the things I've been talking about lately, because I, I do a lot of things that are centered around, I have a movie coming out called Bad Medicine. So a lot of things coming, you know, that, that I'm involved in have to do with medicine and, and synthetic remedies. But it has really landed in me in the past few years that this thing we call God has provided everything that we need. And it grows from the ground, from the soil, every food, every medicine, and even to a laughable degree, most of it's in primary colors as if that intelligence knew someday we would lose our way. And like Legos, they have to map them out and say, crack open a carrot and look at it. It looks it's in shape of an iris of an eye, the inside, and it's eye food. Mm -hmm. crack open a mini walnut and it looks like a mini brain with two hemispheres. And guess what? It's brain food. A bell pepper looks just like a human heart. Four chambers looks just like, oh, it's good for the heart. 
avocado. Looks just like a woman's pregnant belly with a seed inside, and it's great for the cervix. And you can go on down the line, and it's like some benevolent force left this medicine, let thy medicine be thy food, Mm -hmm. left it right here for us. And we have these other maniacs that are saying, no, no, ignore that. That's why I say it's a war against nature. Ignore all that because, you know, we want the stuff that's going to actually damage your natural immune system so that, and your health, which is why we have obesity epidemic, such that you're going to become lifelong customers on our synthetic remedies. Yeah, dependence. Dependence. It's all about desperation and dependence, getting us to a point of being so desperate that we're dependent upon their synthetic life-threatening remedies, poisons. Mm-hmm. And so for me, the real move is us coming back to say, what, first of all, what is my nature? Raising two boys and being deeply involved in education, I'm actually creating a, a, a curriculum that will become a book series and then a series of a filmed series for kids up to about 13 years old is one of my next big ventures after my next film, which is about climate change or the false, falsities of climate narrative. Uh, we become, we begun to explore the question, what is natural and what is normal? Cause we are so confused between what is natural and what is normal. We think repetition is natural because we've seen it. So here's an example. I hear all the parents say, oh, you have a 12 year old. He's about to become a teenager. Oh, that's when it really begins. That's when they rebel and they turn yeah. on the parents and, and that's just natural. And I go, is it? Never happened with me. There you go. And I say, is it just, is it natural or is it just so normalized? Because so many parents don't know how to communicate with their children and stay on the same team that they, they oppress their children and their expression and their curiosity so much that the child then, like my, my kids have never once rolled their eyes and I see all their friends, their dad will be like, Hey, we got a week of time to go. Ah. My kids never do that. And if when I go, hey, hey guys, I have yeah. something I want to share with you. Oh, go, go, go. they'll drop everything they're doing. Yeah. Because totally. they're like, dad's got something cool f- to share us. Because totally. they know above all, and this is how my relationship, we built our relationship early on because I was married once and it did not work. Um, and most of it was me. But in this relationship for the past 21 years, we recognized early on, we said, we have to stay on the same team because yeah. most relationships Amen. become competitive. That's, and that's exactly what it was with my father. It was like, if there was ever a decision to be made, I was on the inside of the decision. Yeah. And it was valued, my opinion and my desires and everything was valued. And then the consequences were laid out. And then ultimately he gave me a choice. And I was one of the best kids you could imagine, you know, like, but why? Because I actually... I actually trusted my dad and I actually trusted and I trusted my mom. They, everything was a discussion. Everything was a, and there was no unnecessary punishment when I learned the lesson because I loved him so much. I didn't want to let him down and I didn't want to let myself down because I really trusted that what they said was real and they were considering it. So even, even bedtimes, you know, like bedtimes are a subtle form of oppression that usually benefits the parents and somewhat helpful for the kids. But my dad was like, listen, and like, this is before school or when I didn't have school, obviously school, you got to fucking wake up. Right. So, but he was like, you want to fucking stay up? You still got to get up. You still got to go to school. So you're just going to be tired. So then I started going to bed earlier. But other than that, yeah. he's like, stay up as long as you want. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Like you go to bed when you want, like it's your choice. He taught you, you know? how to choose. He taught me how to choose, yeah. you know? And then even when it was, even when it was concerning food, I remember I was like, really, I got really into like sugary stuff as most kids do. And my dad was like, all right, like I see this. And I just want you to notice that when you have a bunch of sugar, you get this little rush, you get this little high. But then just pay attention to what happens about an hour later. You get a little sleepier, you get a little Mm -hmm. crankier. And I was like, no, dad, no way. Like, but he like planted that. He's like, it's it's okay, like go for it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not gonna stop you. Ultimately, there's gonna come a time where you're gonna have access to all the fucking sugar in the world. You know, we had a very healthy like house, but there was, you know, I could drink, there was Cokes around and there was, you know, he he liked Milky Ways. There was Milky Ways and there was all kinds of shit that I, and I had freedom. He's like, just pay attention. Just pay attention. How does it feel? And how does it feel when you, when you eat another way? 
And so it was every, every rule and every conversation. There wasn't like, he didn't treat me like a little idiot. He taught me like a, he, he talked to me like a developing brain, even complex issues that were far beyond me. He would go, you know, I was Chris, then, but he'd go, Aubrey, what do you think about this? You know, these are my friends that are having this relationship issue. What do you, what do you think? And I'm like seven and I'm like, mm-hmm. well, you know, I think, and, and then he would be like, well, that's not a bad thought, right. you know, but think about it this way. And I was like, oh yeah, dad, I'm like, that makes sense. And so I started to develop how to think and how to look at my own body. And then that's been such a fucking gift, like such a gift. And I never once got on a different team. Mm -hmm. I've been on my mom's team and my dad's team, you know, the whole way, all the way. And I think that's possible. It's possible, but it requires a different orientation. Again, the same thing you could apply that to the state. If the state started trusting people to make choices, giving them the real, instead of, you know, drugs are bad, don't do drugs, all drugs are banned, blah, blah, blah. Be like, all right, listen, this is, these are the issues with cannabis. This is what you'll experience. This is what you got to look out for. This is this, this is your choice. You know, this is, these are mushrooms. This is what it can create. It can create inflation. It can create underground. Exactly. It's it's not, it's not being pressured by authoritarian. Right. It's like but, trusting, tr- it's like Lao Tzu said, trust them and they become trustworthy. Right. My dad trusted me, my mom trusted me yeah. and I became trustworthy. If, yeah. and, if, and I think that's what Bobby would do when he becomes president mm-hmm. is he, he fundamentally trusts people and he knows there's boundaries and guidelines yeah. and things, structures that we have to keep in place. There's hard boundaries. It's like, you know, no, you can't do this. This is like, right. even if you see this, like this is actually far too dangerous and this is, you know, there is a hard boundary that, and I'm not saying like full lies, we're not ready for that yet. We're not right, conscious right. enough for that yet. And some kids are not conscious enough. There does need to be some hard bounds. You know, I can't as a nine-year-old, you know, take, take the car out on the highway, you know, like, no, right. <laughs> like you'll get your time. Yeah, that's you know, even right. if you want to, like, I'm not going to let you learn the lesson because it's going to end up in a fucking disaster. Right. So I'm not saying no rules and no, no boundaries, of course. But the explanation of that and the understanding of that so that I could always say like, all right, dad, I may disagree with you on this, but I see where you're coming from. I know you're not doing this because you're, you have some thinking. I may just disagree. And then we would talk about it and talk about it. And, and then ultimately we'd come to a, a position where, all right, I don't fully agree with you, dad, but I respect mm-hmm. your position. So yeah. all good. Beautiful. And you're actually, I'm not intending to kiss up to you at all. You're actually a perfect example of what's possible when when people are raised properly you're successful financially i've enjoyed all the times that i've been to your house i've really enjoyed watching the humble way in which you interact with every single guest in your home everyone matters equally you always make sure to find a moment to move to a new location to make sure that people feel you and see you you make them feel very welcomed, loved, and you're also doing good in the world. And you're still, despite knowing a lot, you're a student of everything you experience. Yeah. And you're an alpha energy, but with a very, very sensitive, as you sit here with tears in your eyes, a very sensitive quality that I've seen many times in you, of when you're passionate, that you well up because you feel so deeply. And I had to learn that because I was just all the sensitive forever by being raised that I was. And then I had to actually learn what it is to be a man. And I didn't learn this until I was in my 40s. Yeah. And when I had my children, my wife and I were trying, we were reading all the conscious parenting books. And I saw a documentary one day that changed who I am as a father. And it basically, a a deer popped out of the womb, a baby deer, and stood up and ran away. And I was like, wow, not a wobble, not like the Bambi cartoons I grew up on, but just, Mm -hmm. and I thought, that's instincts. Do I have instincts to be a father? Why am I learning from the opinion of all these other people? when maybe I should just tune in to what I was given naturally and pop out of this womb of fatherhood and, and, and run in the direction that I know is 
my path as a father. Mm -hmm. And the moment I started and I talked to my wife, I said, I'm just going to throw all that crap out the window. Um, because I see a lot of other friends that have adhered to that religiously. And I don't think their kids are doing that well. They're running their lives. They're running the parents' lives. Yeah. They're entitled little brats. We go out to dinner with the family. If the kid decides he wants to leave in 15 minutes, they'll say, okay, can you box it up to go? We have to leave. Really? Or they'll like, radically adjust the menu where they'll make, yeah. make the kitchen make pizza or chicken tenders Whatever, when you're right? at a Japanese place yeah. or some and, shit like that. And the thing, and I saw in this, in this kind of conscious new age work, cult that I was trapped in for a long time, um, I saw the, the children, I started to experience a lot of younger boys because my kids were having friends come over and I, and I would see their parents and I would see the kids like, this is a cool kid. Man, he looks me in the eyes. He says, thank you. Yes, sir. And may we have this. And uh, thank you for letting me come over and play. Like, this is an awesome kid. Like, let me get to know his dad. I want to find out who this dad is, who the mom is too, that this little guy already has such reverence for big people. Mm -hmm. And then you see the kids that were just like, so disrespectful. Like I have to remind them over and over, Hey buddy, we don't do that in our house. You don't mm -hmm. can't throw things. You can't mm -hmm. scream. You can't like, and they're mm -hmm. just like, screw you, man. And what I recognized, my, my son as I had a, a friend, they were about five years old apiece. And my son just loved this kid. But, but we were starting to get tired of having him come over because we were like, every time he comes over, there's a problem. He breaks something or he's just unruly. And, and we became friends with his parents. And we loved his parents. They were super cool people. But one day I took my son and this little friend out for an entire day and I just treated them to the funnest day ever. And this kid the whole time was being disrespectful and I had to keep reminding him, we don't do that here in this family. It's a little different, you know, we don't. And uh, please let me know if you're going to leave and run away or whatever. I, I'm in charge of you. I got to know where you are, man. And it's like, you don't just take off and go yeah. to another store and I'm, I'm like panicked. So it was a, a day of just like, this kid does, doesn't care, doesn't care. Anything I say doesn't matter. And finally on the way home, he kept screaming in the car and I kept saying, don't do that. My son's saying, don't do that. <laughs> and finally I pulled the car over really abrupt. I mean, the tires squealed and I turned around and I let him have it. And he was like, and I said, you got it? Never again, bud. And I turned around, I started, we were heading home and I heard my, my son go, my dad's not like your dad, don't do that, right? Mm -hmm. And we get home. And uh, the next day there's a play date. And for the first time ever, the two parents, I looked at the people and two parents are there with the boy. And I'm like, here we go. He told them, we're gonna have to deal with this. I opened the door and the kid ran to me and grabbed me and, and wouldn't let go. And his parents go, wow, he never does that. And he was, from that point on, this kid was so respectful of me and just wanted to, we'd be dinner. He's like, can yeah. I sit on your lap? And I'm like, what? Like, what, what, what happened here? What it taught me was the kids are smart enough to know that our world is very dangerous. If they don't have an alpha in their life that they feel they, that can take care of them and has their back, they don't feel safe in this world. Yeah. His dad was so soft, good guy, loving, loving guy. But it was constant, you know, like, I'll make up a name because I don't want to give this away in case they see this. But, you know, Bobby, don't do that. Don't hit your mother. Don't hit. We don't hit. Hey, I see you're angry, but we never, that's like the extent of, yeah. of his. And I became a much more, I jokingly call it the Republican father. I became much more like, no, let's have some respect in this house because Brilliant. I'm going to teach you how to become a man yeah. and what the world is really like. And this kid just became so close to me. And the stronger I got with my kids, balanced. That's why I'm acknowledging you from being strong alpha and also very sensitive. That's the, that's, that's the archetype I am for my boys cuddle, love, just oozing with love and gratitude, eye gazing with, you know, every other day, making them know, sure how much I love them and how lucky I am to be their father. And at the same time, don't cross that line. Yeah, totally. They, they, my kids feel safe with me. They know daddy will take care of business if anyone tries to ever come and hurt them. Right. And the moment this kid had the first experience of an alpha who said, I'm not going to take your shit. This, I draw the line right here and you're not going to get away with that. And, and you want to be around our family? This is my rules and don't ever break them. He was like, I could see him going from like, yeah, I run my family, but it actually leaves them feeling unsafe because then they're thinking, 
if the two biggest pillars in my life I have control over, who's got my back? Yeah. So they actually need to feel safe by allowing that presence. And so I've witnessed that in you. And I've always just wanted to share that with you, just witnessing who you are being. Um, be, and I've never heard that story from you of how you were raised. And now it makes perfect sense. I know you do a lot of inner work. So I thought, you know, perhaps it's just the inner work, but having that foundation of a parent, you know, cause our lives, our lives are comprised by every choice we make. And so them giving you the power to choose, but also the guidance to say that we choose for you. Yeah. We're not going to put a, a loaded gun in your hand at five years old. Right because we're responsible enough to understand the development process that you're in right now. And that wouldn't be a safe choice for you. And right. we love you. My kids know the metaphor I use for them. And then I'll turn this over to you was I said, listen, um, you've come to climb a mountain. We all come to climb a mountain. And I've been up and down the mountain that you're just starting to climb multiple times. The first time I got to the mountain, I took every wrong turn you can possibly imagine. I learned everything the hard way and fell off every cliff and injured myself over and over and over and had to get back to the base and start that climb again over and over and over because I didn't have a lot of guidance in my life. I'm here to actually show you the direct path straight up that mountain. But you are going to be tempted at certain intersections, crossroads of your life, to take another turn mm -hmm. because you're going to prove to yourself that it's your choice and not mine. And I'm going to be here for you back at that intersection when you return, waiting for you, loving you just as much, understanding that you had a valuable experience for you. But I, my job is to help you get up that mountain. So everything I teach you is to get you where you choose to be, not where I choose you to be, where you choose to be, whatever that mountaintop turns out to be for you. I'm going to show you every possible path of least resistance that I can show you. And I'm going to leave it up to you to take that path or not. I'm going to love you regardless. Yeah. And my, so my boys know that when I say, Hey, we have something to talk about. I'm in the bathtub last night and I was like, Hey guy. And they had two friends stay over and they come down. They're like, what's up dad? And I go, I just wanted to say, and I planted a seed. I said, I want to respect you tonight. And it's a, th it's a Thursday night. I have to get up early. You don't, you don't have school. You don't study on Fridays. Um, and I don't want to disrespect you in front of your friends by telling you it's time to go to bed because I need my sleep. So I just ask of you guys that you keep that in mind and you let your friends know and you're in, you're sleeping by one o'clock. Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah. Can we make that agreement? Cause I hear your firms are above mine. Yeah, totally. And they're like, got it, dad. And they did it. Yeah, for sure. Cause they love you. Cause they, they respect. They love and respect you. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the other the other side of that, what you're saying is <clears throat> also my dad and my stepdad were both alphas, alphas in different ways, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, there's, there's just interesting stories about that of like taking care of the family and being able to make decisive action. I think my, my stepmom told me a story when I was sitting Shiva for my father after he passed. And it was a story that I didn't know, but <clears throat> they had hired a British nanny a high au pair British nanny, mm -hmm. highly credentialed, whatever, to help take care of my little brother, Will. And she was encroaching on my stepmom's kind of authority and kind of undermining things. And my stepmom was, you know, this is early in their relationship still, early enough. And, you know, she was like, oh, I don't know how to tell this to Michael and, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. And and uh, so she finally starts to say it. My dad just listens and goes, okay, she's fired. Mm -hmm walks downstairs and goes, you're fired. Take your stuff and get out. You know, it was like, he was able to make like, once he got it, he's like, oh yeah, I'm fucking done. Like he had the ability to be clear in his boundary. And then other times when I would get a little out of line, you know, like get a little too full of myself. I remember me and my cousin, Jesse, we thought we were real good at tennis. My dad was a good tennis player. And we thought we were real good and we were popping off to my dad and, you know, like, oh, we could fucking take you, you know, if it doubles, we'll fucking, we'll, we'll take you. He goes, oh yeah. And he goes, walks into the kitchen and he gets a frying pan. He's like, come on boys, let's play. I'm, I'm going to use this frying pan instead of a tennis racket. <laughs> and he used a frying pan and he kicked our ass <laughs> and he laughed and he just let us have it. 
And that's like, awesome. it was awesome. awesome. It was awesome. So there's these moments like that. And then also my dad would get, you know, even though my dad was powerful and he could have insulated himself, he had this group of friends and the chip and Dean and Jimmy, yeah. and they would all come over and they'd play basketball out in the, out in the tennis court backyard. Right. And they would just go at it and battle. And I'd watch my dad just battle, you know, like battle and it'd get heated and they'd be talking shit and they'd be, and I thought, I thought like, oh yeah. Like, this is, this is a part of it. Like, I want to be that alpha on the court. I want to be that alpha in there because that was also modeled. You know, my stepdad and my stepbrothers, anytime I would get a little too full of myself, they would just beat my ass in something. But I got better every time. Yeah. And like, I, I, it was enculturated. Like, there's, there's that aspect of the masculine principle as well, which right. is also like very important, which is a part of this existence. And so... You know, I've really had such gifts in carrying both of those elements forward. The I'm always forgiven. I remember one time I I decided I was going to take out my my stepmom's car. She had a Mercedes, and I was like, I'm going to drive this one today. You know, and like I didn't ask. They probably would have let me drive it, but like I had a I don't know a Ford Explorer, or something com yeah. comfortable and safe. It's a fine car and nice, yeah. but it wasn't a Mercedes. I was like, I want to drive this thing. I bet it's fast. And I'm going to pull out of the garage and I'm a little nervous. And I go, I cut the wheel too tight to pull out and I scrape the side of it before I even get out of the garage. And I'm like, oh my God, what did I do? I tried to hit the time machine button in my mind. I don't know if anybody's right. ever oh, done the, that oh, where yeah. you go like oh, yeah. squeeze really hard and you're like, yeah. this didn't happen. I'm going to wake up from this oh, and yeah. it didn't happen. And, but it happened. And I remember that could be the a undo point. button. That, yeah, that could be a point where my dad just fucking laid into me and I felt so guilty and I was just so wrecked because I known that I did something that I shouldn't have been doing and it had a consequence. And it was there, like that Christic impulse just came in like, hmm. it's all right, son. We're always going to have impulses and desires to do things and sometimes they're going to get the better of you. And like, you're basically, it was like, you're always forgiven. You're safe. You didn't hurt anybody. You know, and he just... It was done. It wasn't like he grounded me for right. that or because I felt so terrible already. He could see that. You know, just tears in my eyes, like, I'm so sorry. Right. You know, and it was like, it's done. Don't worry about right. it. We can fix the car. You know, like I see you've learned the lesson. That's right. And like, so you're always forgiven. So there wasn't anything that was an over over response to the act. I actually learned forgiveness. Like, oh fuck. Like you can be forgiven when you fall. When you fall there's mm. that aspect of the father too that's like it's okay i love you yes you know and so so much of all of those beautiful things and you know i was obviously very touched by you reflecting that to me you know so much i have to just give credit to to where credit is you and yes i have done a lot of work and i've grown and and part of that was also because my dad recognized that even with how well i was raised i needed an initiation Mm -hmm. And that's when I was 18, he just invited me. And I'm telling this story in my new book that'll come out next year, Psychonaut. I'm telling this first story of when he invited me to go sit with his shaman after high school. And was like, this is, you know, basically an initiation. If you're up, if you're up for it, you know, you're going to see aspects of the world that I could never show you. How old were you? 18. And Aya? Uh, no, it was actually psilocybin and mdma okay and it was one it this came through as a shaman that came through like she's more of a sitter more of like the highest level sitter mm -hmm. she wasn't trying to adjust the energy a shaman adjusts the energy mm -hmm. that's the distinction i make between a shaman and a sitter yeah. a sitter just allows the medicine right. to fold holds the boundaries and keeps things safe holds the container but doesn't try to influence it and it's a really super like valuable practice just to be able to be a sitter Shaman is another level where you'll be able to adjust energy, sing in ikaros or songs. Right. And, and, but she's really just holding the space. And it was, yeah, psilocybin and MDMA in, uh, in the mountains north of Santa Fe. And that initiation was an initiation that helped me grow from the separate self identity, mm -hmm. an atheist separate self. Again, I was in my allergic to God. Yeah. There is no God. This is all bullshit because of what I'd experienced when I moved to Texas. It initiated me into a whole new worldview. And so mm -hmm. the necessity for initiations, which have been part of culture, 
from the you know the beginning of time but they've all been hollowed out just like all the holidays which used to be festivals that allowed you to drop ordinary life like burning man and experience right. some a real festival they've all been commercialized commodified yeah. hollowed out emptied out all of these things even marriage ceremonies are like I know. I fucking can't I stand know. them. They're the worst. <laughs> they Funerals, the, the whole thing. Everything's been hollowed out of the soul of the thing. But this initiation was all. It was all soul. It was all real. It was all something. And that initiation then propelled me. You know, that was like the key moment, the defining moment in my transition from the separate self, Aubrey, mm -hmm. into the greater into the greater Aubrey that's connected to the field. And then he had the intelligence to start me on that path. And once I've been on that path, there's no looking back. What a great move. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I've already told my boys the, the certain rituals that we'll go to another country to partake in together when they're old enough. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I've, I started doing ayahuasca work in 2006 and, uh, and went really hard for seven and a half years. Uh, Nadia and I, my wife, we started to host a shaman, a Peruvian shaman, uh, about once every month or every other month. And, and then we started traveling around the world with him. And, um, what I saw through that work is, is, is really hard to describe. As I mentioned earlier, it just, it was, it was so unifying and people would wake up into the remembrance that I've been speaking into is really just understand what their role in this experience is. Right. And, uh, and so it, you know, and there's a lot of people, I think that that's the part of the extreme religious side that don't, at the, at the one hand, they're so extreme that, that nothing exists if it isn't in the Bible. But on the other hand, they really, really devalue their God and don't give their God enough credit. Because as the Bible says, this and more you shall do. It created in my likeness, what I've done, you shall do more. Yeah, uh, the evolving nature. Yeah, the, I think the living, the, the, the living, the living word. The, and it's and it's that's missed a lot because, um, this editor that I mentioned earlier, that uh, he, uh, wonderful human being, but I, you know, his 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 narrow religious beliefs were getting in the way of him editing for me because there were a lot of things that would come up, and I'd say, "What happened to the guy's story about the meditation and the breakthrough, or whatever?" He's like, "Ah, uh, meditation, like what?" Oh, it's dangerous. It's, a, oh, really? Tell me about that. So meditation is sitting in silence and allowing higher intelligence, God, to actually be listened to. Mm -hmm. And what what's, I get that all of this, all of these tools can be weaponized and they have, and having escaped the new age cult, um, I can look back and see how much of it was and how many people that, are still in that cult that I know that are suffering. Yeah. And they haven't found oneness. They haven't found peace and unity and all the stuff they've been preaching for 20, 25 years, they ha still haven't found it. And so there's something there that I think is becomes a deterrent from the simplicity of, of the, the plight of life and, and just getting that it's all within. It's right. just right here. It's, there's no work you have to do other than strip away everything that isn't that. And so we got in this conversation and, and, um, and he said, oh yeah, all that saging and, and, and incense. And he said, well, if I, the devil. when I go into the, someone's home and they're doing that, I'm like, I'm, I run. And I go, wow, man, that's very interesting. I said, how do you know that what their, their, is, doesn't that their intention matter? What, what are they doing it for? Maybe it's just the scent and the odor in the house that they're want their home to smell beautiful. Or maybe they're, you know, it's, 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 it's a form of prayer, right? If, if the, you sage, when you walk in the doorway, I understand it's woo woo and you don't have to believe in it. There's a lot of the stuff that I've kind of divorced from the, from the, um, assumption that it's doing anything. I'd now like to focus on the tangible stuff that I can see results from and, and, and feel and know from my personal ex direct experience that this is actually beneficial to my life. Right. And the rest of the stuff is, is just ritual and habit and show and all that stuff. And, and I was like, feel free to do it. But, but don't kid yourself to think that it's, um, that it's all you need to do to live a great life because there are a lot of people who have focused just on that that I know for the past 25 years are not living a good life. There's something still missing for them. And, uh, and so we got in this conversation and I said, um, I said, wow, man, it's just, 
there's so much fear in everything you say. There's like, like a lot of fear. Like you're afraid someone has the opportunity to put demons in you to like, there's a lot yeah. of, yeah. like you're susceptible. And I don't think you give your God enough credit. And uh, when then the, I, the subject of crystals came up and I said, listen, my wife's into crystals. I think they're beautiful. I think they potentially hold great power. I'm just not into them. But that doesn't, my mind isn't closed. My, my heart isn't closed sure. to what they could potentially provide for the human body. And he basically was like, oh, all that stuff. And I said, did God, from your belief, did God create you? Of course. Did God create you to need food? Of course. And I said, what part of you negates the idea that God created the crystal and that it could be feeding you in a different way than food? And, and because it's not, ultimately his answer was because it's not mentioned in the Bible. And I said, but this and more you shall do. Yeah. So is everything in there or more that we are meant to now go and discover? And if God made all this, which you say he did, you know, why, why, why can't we focus more on the way we interact with these things? Um, instead of immediately assuming that it's dark and evil if, yeah. if it's not if our pastor doesn't tell us it's good it's it's a, it's the living relationship with the divine that, that is to be known not believed in right I, that's yeah. been my path it's been an experiential path so let's just talk let's use crystals you brought it up i always loved crystals i thought they were yeah. beautiful i collected them as a child but when people started assigning all of these powers and you'll go to a store and they'll say this crystal has this power i'm like i, I don't feel the power Right. I don't feel the power. But then 24 years into the psychonautic journey, I'm just now starting to be a, such a finely tuned radio mm -hmm. that I'm starting to feel a little thing. Mm -hmm. It's subtle. It's so subtle. I have to get, again, so quiet. Like God speaks in the whisper, right? Crystals aren't going to overwhelmingly do mm -hmm. some magical Gandalf shit. But if you're just finely tuned enough and you just hold the right crystal in the right moment you might just feel a little something and so it's just a little clue of like mm -hmm. always keeping an open mind i was just like crystals are beautiful this is all nonsense mm -hmm. i love them but yeah. it's nonsense but then just subtly enough subtly enough i start to feel a little bit same with something like uh you know people using clearing tools tobacco or palo right. santo is like yeah it smells good but yeah, right. But then you get with somebody who can do like a really good tobacco cleanse or a cinnamon cleanse like my, you know, my teacher, Maestro Orlando could do. And you feel it when you're on the medicine and you're like, holy shit, that tobacco mm -hmm. like caused me to go through a full body purge and I could feel the energy moving from. Mm -hmm. And then when I feel it, that's the only thing I can trust. It's, and it's also like through your body, you envision God. Mm -hmm. Like, I think we have to get back to being able to feel it, being able to be sensitive enough mm -hmm. and then decide what's there, what's not. I mean, there's lots of fancy contraptions with copper and fucking pyramids that are made that have things in them. And I'm like, mm, I, know, I can't feel it, but I'm open to it. You know, I'm open, I'll bring it into a journey one day and I'll yeah. see if this thing actually, but it's about like, can I really, can I really feel? And that skepticism is important because otherwise important. you can get led down a variety of different paths. You know, one of those categories is going to piss off a lot of my friends. One of those categories is uh, the biogeometry movement. Mm -hmm. I'm just not sensitive enough. And I had them come and I was like, I'm going to give it this try. I had them come to my house and yeah. I tried the little devices and I'm like, I don't feel shit. <laughs> like nothing happened yeah. as far as I can tell. Right. So one, there's two premises. And yeah. as like a good scientific rationalist would say, well, there's two premises. One, I'm not sensitive enough to feel this. I'm too crude an instrument. Yeah. Or it's not doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> like either one. And yeah. I'm not closing my mind to either of those possibilities. It's just like, well, we'll see. Yeah, that's it's it's so important. Um, you you remember the book Four Agreements, yeah, right? Don Miguel, who, who is an old friend of mine, and he's, then his, he's he was that was my first encounter with someone who I would say was a true mystic. Yeah, right. He's, Don Miguel, Don Miguel was he the, really yeah. walks the fucking yeah. walk. He yeah. when he hugs you, it's like it's like the hug of the father. And and then what was his what was the fifth agreement? Do you remember what the fifth agreement was? His follow up book. I didn't read that one. People were um, upset because it wasn't what they thought it would be. He did the four agreements and, the, the, and then he did the, the fifth agreement. 
And it was, be skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> and people were like, what? That's not spiritual. That's not poetic. And just be skeptical. Yeah, be skeptical about all of it. It's, it's, it's important that we do that. I've had so many experiences. I mean, I've, I've, I've filmed placebo tests where we literally took, it was a, a movie that we're, we were doing called The Magic Pill. And this piece actually didn't make it into the movie. I have it on storage somewhere that we might end up using it one day. We hired 11 people. We took literature about ayahuasca and we plugged in a fake name. And we, we hired 11 people. And they came in and we gave them this literature and we said, you have, you're going to take one pill three times a day for 72 hours and take this home and, and read up on it before you take your first pill. And it was all about lucid dreams and connecting with the divine and the spirit and seeing the fractals and what the fract, all this stuff and, and how it got people over addiction and out of bad relationships. It was all ayahuasca literature. And, uh, they, 11 people go home, one dropped out, just personal reasons. And I looked up all these, I did all this deep study on, on, on nocebo and placebo tests. And so I, we were expecting about 30 to 40% of the people to have a profound experience because that's about what the numbers hit, sometimes 50%. One by one, 72 hours later, we brought all the people in. A guy had originally came in, we picked people that had issues. So a guy came in on a cane an older couple, they were in their late 60s, early 70s. They were at odds and, and sleeping in different beds and, and relationship over. A um, bunch of different issues. We interviewed people and to find out what's going on with them before we said, yeah, you're the, the perfect person for this test. It turned out that all 10 people who remained in the study had profound experiences, 100% results. We later learned because the people we found them through our, e our public email. We, do it, we were doing a newsletter blast every, so we found them through our newsletter. And so usually those studies are, you know, um, cl clinical institutions that will hire randomly out of Craigslist or whatever. So the people already come in not knowing and not trusting who these people are. But because they already trusted me and my company, they bought into this thing hook, line, and sinker. And in 72 hours, people sat down one at a time in front of us. The guy walks in without a cane and we went, oh, Jim, what's up? And he's like, don't need my cane anymore, man. This stuff is incredible. It went on. What was in the pill? Alfalfa, like a blade of grass. The older couple came in. They renewed their vows within 72 hours. They were deeply in love again, had come back to the sleeping in the same bed. Mm -hmm. A young lady um, quit her job and found what she said was the love of her life. One story after the next, we were looking at each other. Someone would walk out and we go, what the fuck is happening here? What is going on? Profound experiences. And then we had to break it to him. We said, there's nothing in that little capsule, a blade of grass. And we were expecting some people to be upset because we lied to them. We did. But it was, you know, it was for this cause to really find out what the power of the mind was. And thankfully, no one was upset. Every, people cried because they said, I did this myself. Mm. Yes, you did. See what happens when your attention, and I equate our attention to being the will of the rudder of our ship. Mm -hmm. Our attention has been hijacked by pirates. Mm -hmm. And I know this because I used to work with those pirates. As a filmmaker, I, I have spent many hours in boardrooms with high level ad executives as they formulate how they're going to get people to buy their product. And it is through mental manipulation. It is through making people feel less than it is through sexual attraction. It is never about almost never about the product and, and what the product's about. Yeah. It's just, we need to capture their attention. Once we have your attention, we can steer you wherever we want you. And if you make them afraid, then you get even more attention. To totally on that. Then they go, here's the will of, take me to a, a more safe place, please. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm the politician going to, I'm going to stop climate change. I'm the one who just vote for me and you'll, your children will have a future. This is the, just the BS, you know, thing that they've been doing forever. So witnessing that, having seen, having moments when we used to live in community, there were 21 of us living in Ojai, California and live, live workspace, right? So I had two companies and 21 of us, everyone working for one of the two companies. And this is when I say new age cult, because it was 
you know, a cult that it really wasn't a cult, but it was highly spiritual, right? You know, and we had every kind of guru coming every month you can imagine and coming with these experiences. And, and one day, you know, we had this quote unquote guru come and um, he passed this rock around everybody. We did a meditation. He passed a rock around. This is inspired by your story of like, I didn't feel this, this modality that your friends right. introduced you to. And he passed a rock around. Everybody was like, he gave some amazing story about how it was blessed and how, where this rock has come from and who has held it. And everyone was like, oh my God, wow. I can just feel that. I like, I can feel it from here. Can you? Oh, wow. Pass it on. <gasps> Everybody's doing this. And I grab it and I went. Yeah. Nothing. And the guy goes, interesting. That was a rock from your driveway. <laughs> and he goes, you're the only one that didn't f get fooled by it. That's interesting. And I was like, oh, wow. That's what, what is that mechanism within me that because I'm skeptical, yeah. because I'm a hard-headed rebel bastard in many ways when it comes to like adhering to any group or any kind of sure. rule, that's what saved me from, from so buying into these things that, you know, when COVID is announced, I went bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, me too. That, was, that was like, that was the initial I don't buy thing. It. Yeah. All about control. Yeah. And it's not denying that there is, that you can get sick with COVID. You know, well, yeah, it's just, well, yeah. it's, it's, or it's or a that thing. Even I can get suckered into things. I have, I was on sure. tour with Bernie Sanders. I, I, you know, there's, I, I've been suckered into these things. So I don't, it's not foolproof. Yeah. Um, it's, it's becoming more and more foolproof, but the challenge is how do you allow that to happen where you become really clear? Your BS detector becomes really clear and you get that, that 80, 90% of all this stuff is either misinformation, disinformation, or just someone trying to hustle and scam something yeah. and stay positive and yeah, optimistic. And, and also not get sucked down these rabbit holes where you expose like the bullshit that's come, like the safe and effective lie, you know, yeah. like I always knew COVID was something that people could get sick from, but just the response was where that's when I called bullshit. I was like, yeah. this is, we're way overblowing this thing. Like something is really wrong something with the response here. Like there's something else at play. And, you know, I've had COVID a couple of times and it's not fun, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm over it in two days and, you know, taking that horse paste and, <laughs> you know, yeah. like doing the things, vitamin D shots and yeah. I trust my immune system. And I know that, I know that there's, you know, been many people affected by this. I'm not trying to, I'm not a COVID mm -hmm. denier. I know that it's a fucking thing I've gotten and it's mm -hmm. felt different. It felt unnatural, actually. Yeah. It felt like an unnatural progression of a, of a sickness within my body. It was like, all right, this is fucking tested positive. Like, yeah. all right, this is a thing. But I could tell that the response was way off, that this, this, this whole narrative had, had faults in it. And then I've also seen people who've seen that and then gone like so far in their skepticism mm -hmm. that it leads them down to places of like flat earth theory. Oh, like, yeah. well, oh yeah? yeah, well, dinosaurs aren't real. There's no such thing as flat earth. Nuclear bombs are fake. You know, like all these whole, ra and I'm like, yo. Birds are all a military invention. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, it's, it's crazy. Like, it's, you know, it's like, yo, like you've taken it like way too far. And yeah, I think that's yeah. also something that people want. It's why flat earthers have never been censored because yeah. like the forces are like, oh good. Yeah. So we can use these guys to show that that's, that's anybody a, who questions the narrative exactly. is fucking that's a completely great full of shit. If you look at John Oliver's attempt to take down a pandemic one, he went moon landing, which there are some questions whether or not that should sure. happen or not. Um, flat earth, pandemic. <laughs> and so this is how they do it, right? So you have to get everyone triggered by the absurdity of these things. And then you introduce pandemic and they've already lumped it into that, that arena. And that is, and I try to tell some of my friends that are flat earthers and all that. And listen, believe whatever you want to believe. I don't believe that. I just don't. And if, if someone can show me something that convinces me, and there was a time about three years ago when I went down that rabbit hole and there was a, someone showed me something and I went, I don't remember what it was at this point, but I thought, Ooh, that's suspect. Let me go deeper on this. You might have be onto something here. And I went deeper, deeper, deeper. And I realized that if they're not censoring it, yeah. first of all, if they're uh, allow you to say whatever you, and flat earthers do not get censored, there's a reason for that. So first be very skeptical of that because it's the truth they censor. Right. 
and that sometimes they plant the appearance of truth within these narratives. This is the true controlled opposition psychological op operations. They'll plant something within these, a fake photograph that's obviously fake that anyone who knows Photoshop, whatever can look at and say it's fake. And they, they'll plant it on the NASA site or whatever to do something. So people can go, if that's fake and we can prove it, then this whole thing is a scam because they want to be able to sustain the absurdities so they can tangle them with things like pandemic. Mm -hmm. They can now just say they oh, have these tinfoil hat wearing, but that's, that's dying. They're losing the power on that now because most of the world is going, you know what? The conspiracy theories are right way more than they're wrong. And, and so let's say 10% of them are just crazy unhinged, like, okay, good. Let those go. But no longer does conspiracy theorist have the um, bitter taste that it, that it once Which had. Which was a CIA psyop from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. They created that word That's to right. marginalize people who were questioning the JFK assassination. And right? if you just explore what the word means, what does it mean? A conspiracy is two or more people planning something and a theory. So I have an idea that two or more people are planning something. That's like everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, the yeah. entire World Economic Forum are m thousands of people behind closed doors planning things. Right. So that is a conspiracy theory. That's all it really means. But somehow they've turned it into this, this third rail that, that was very effective just a couple of years ago. Yeah, sure. And that's, that's when they went after Plandemic One for me, um, it was a very interesting experience because the first 48 hours were just people literally reaching out. The majority of people were like, I'm in tears. Why, why? This isn't a, a, a very emotional film. Why are so many people in tears? And they'd say, because I now know I'm not crazy. I knew, I felt intuitively, I felt there's something wrong. And your film is the first thing that helped me realize that, because I was just feeling crazy. Like, why is the whole world moving in one direction and, and I see something else? Am I nuts? And so people were just high five and thank you and all oh, celebrating. And then the media came out and said, oh man, what is this film? It's already has millions of views online. It's going crazy. It, it disrupted their plan to hold, sequester everyone into their homes and assuming they're all going to, wa going to watch the corrupt mainstream media. And they're going to be indoctrinated by, by that narrative, come out of their homes in two months and be puppets on a string. And Plandemic was one of the th many things that, that foiled their plan because they underestimated the people, the resilience and brilliance of humanity, because they assumed you're just going to watch MSNBC and Fox and CNN and all that, right? Cool. No, the people went right to the encrypted apps and they started sharing information. Mm. This birthed a generation of citizen journalists, right? Because they went, no, I'm on, I'm on, join me on Signal, you know, on Telegram, whatever. Here's some, and I watched it shift because during the whole process, I was being invited to speak at these large events. And in the, in the first two years, I would, my only preparation I ever made for a talk was let me find my latest research, something that people don't know, and I'll bring it to the audience and I'll drop the bomb on them. And I loved doing that because it'd be like, did you guys know that he's related to her and that Anthony Fauci's daughter was really part of the death? But, but and people are like, what? What? And I can't do that anymore, Aubrey. Everywhere I go and I think I'm going to drop a bomb on the audience, the whole audience goes, yeah, we saw it. Yeah, we know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just shared this. Yeah. And then they'll, they'll one up me. They'll say, yeah, but did you hear? And I'm like, no, <laughs> wow, what? Mm -hmm. The audience is so far ahead now because everyone is doing the one thing that we have been told not to do forever. Don't discuss politics. And that was a big ploy to get us to just go, let those guys take care of that. And once a year, twice a year, we'll go and we'll just vote for everyone that, that represents the color that we like. And then we go back to our jobs and let them take care of our lives. And now people are talking every day and probably too much. Right. They're obsessed, right? They're going, what is going on? Did you hear about this? And the school yeah. board and Phoenix and blah, blah, blah. And they're aware of all the stuff that's happening right now. And that is the beginning of something incredibly powerful that we have never experienced um, as humans on this planet. Have we ever been in a situation where people are like, no, I, I, I don't trust. I've lost trust. And so we have to trust something. So when we've lost trust in all the authorities, all the elected leaders, we've lost trust in the, the corporations that have all gone woke that we used to think were the greatest things ever. Now we're like, I don't know if I want to support 
you know, right. NBA anymore or whatever it is, whatever it is. Disney movies. Disney movies, right. All these things that we thought were benevolent and wonderful. It's wonderful. Good. Lose your trust in all that crap because that's what you should never have trusted in the first place. So then the question becomes, what do you trust? What do you trust? And that's how people are finding something greater than themselves because they're mm. going, I don't have all the information, so I have to receive guidance from someplace. Yeah. So let me go back into doing this work. Let me listen to the trees and the plants and, and God. And like you said, by whatever name you choose, just don't make the mistake to think that you are all that is mm -hmm. because your life will not end well. Yeah. Yeah. I think the archetype of the sacred warrior is it emerges when the field demands it. You know, there's all the stories of, you know, think of Gladiator, for example, or, you know, even William Wallace. William Wallace, you know, if, if let's take the movie Braveheart as a, as a story that's representative of, of an idea, right? William Wallace was going to be happy to live with Murren and be in the Glade and have some kids and like, but then Empire's force was too oppressive and they took something from him that was invaluable. And it awoke a sacred warrior within him that led to the liberation of Scotland. Of course, Robert the Bruce had to carry it out, but he gets, you know, so much credit for that. And I think we're in a time now where empire's pressing so close that people who would normally be happy to raise a good family and, you know, do their own thing and, you know, hang out with their friends, have bowling night, have whatever, just mm -hmm. kind of, they're being like awakened. And I think that's what, empire is underestimating empire is underestimating that the more they push yes they'll get some of the mob on their side and they'll but it's actually a smaller group than they think and they're underestimating the lions that they're waking up mm -hmm. you know and that's i've seen that process happen with me and it, it's a process of deeper and deeper levels of commitment and that's why i've been deeply inspired by people like yourself and del bigtree and jp sears and people who've early on like really early on were willing to actually step into the fray, take the arrows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel myself every day more and more as I feel it pressing a, a greater thing emerging from myself. And also in some ways, like a little bit, and, I, and I'd like your opinion on this, like a little bit of like, come on, man. You know, like I've had allies and I'm like, that are, that see what I see, but are, aren't willing to like fully step in and go, I'm all in for all life. I'm pushing all the chips in no matter yeah. what. You know, but oh, I'm worried about reputation. I don't want to get attacked. It's like you have to be willing to be hated in this world yeah. to step up as a sacred. You have to be willing to lose and to sacrifice. And of course. It's the hero's journey. Yeah. It's the hero's journey. And, and you're right. There are still a lot of people. It's shocking to me. I understood in 2020. I understood in 2021. We're now in 2023, close to 2024. And it's shocking to me. It, how many people are still holding on to that and it shows really because we've been so primed through identity politics that we think the identity is what matters so everyone's afraid to have their identity tarnished because they've worked so hard to build and right. paint that perfect facade but i always try to see the beauty in, in all of it and for me the beauty is this is there's something benevolent at the core of their lack of courage. Yes, ultimately is a lack of courage, <laughs> but what they don't want to lose informs you what matters to them. They want to be connected. There's something primal and intrinsic within us that needs to be connected with the human organism. And they found their connection and their connection unfortunately has been built and bonded but through agreement. And they know that if they disagree, the bond is broken. So they're willing to resist their own life's purpose, their own impulse to do something. That hurts when you have an impulse and you know there's a right thing to do, right? Like there's a, a, a burning car and there's a baby strapped in a baby seat. And you have time to go save it, but you decide not to because you might get hurt. And you're going to live with that your whole life. You let, let that baby perish. So there's an impulse that says, I'm willing to risk my life for that life. 
there's something very noble and 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 very primal in that and so at the core of this it informs us that this connection is so deep so necessary to our experience here in life that we're willing to suffer the consequences of not doing something what people need to wake up to is everything that they think they're preserving is going to be gone anyway if they don't do something yeah so yeah. we have all these people out in the world with millions and billions of dollars and they're hoarding it oh the dollar might collapse and whatever and they're hoarding it and they don't understand that by stepping out using first their voice there's a reason that our constitution the first amendment is the power of speech the freedom of speech there's a reason the Bible says, in the beginning was the word. Our voice is our medicine to heal what's happening. So first voice, speaking. And then it's our resources. Now, in this physical realm that we've created, the necessity for the currency of money, why aren't there more millionaires and billionaires stepping forward to say, let's fund this and fund everything? Right. You know, my donors are the same donors that JP has, that Del Bigtree has. There's 12 donors funding this whole damn thing. And they're not the richest people on the planet. Yeah. They might be worth $3 million, but they're giving the last of it away because they, under, they get it. They get that pretty soon. Their money won't be worth anything. And so let's support the front line any way we can so we get to cross this threshold together and, and look back in our golden years and know that our stories will forever be told that we were the generation that saved america and america was the firewall to protect all other nations which is the truth mm -hmm. and so in that essence without without it being too bombastically arrogant in that essence together we saved the world yeah and it's real and it's tangible and it's possible and it's inevitable if we just get past this false connection with tribe, with the collective, because people are also waking up to realize that. Like all the people that were fighting for woke just yesterday, today they're being attacked by everyone that they've gone out of their way because they realize at a certain point they keep adding new boxes. You tick a box, you tick a box, yeah. you tick a box. Okay, I'm all for supporting transgender people. Dress how you want, identify how you want. That's great. Sure. And then it's like, oh, you want more rights than me? Oh, wait a minute. That's interesting. And you're, you know, we have a, a, a transgender mass shooter in Tennessee that they hide the, the, her manifesto from the world. And when it's another shooter, they blast it to the world. They don't want people to know that, like, why, why is she getting special treatment? And, and then everyone else gets persecuted. Why, is, why do we have these protected classes? The reason is, is because it's the power of resentment. You know, and it's one of the policies that I strongly disagree with Bobby on. And the beautiful thing about our friendship is, and he's so humble that I tell him to his face. Yeah, and, he's, that's still, cool. and he's still and he still carries yeah. you as a friend. But he's he like he's all he's for a different form. I have to say, just to give him credit, a different form of reparations. It's a it's a if there is a sane form of reparations, that's the one he wants. But I disagree with all of it because at the end of the day, it's going to damage black people because what it creates is resentment give every black person a hundred thousand dollars in this country and then you got the irish stepping forward the chinese stepping forward every other culture which is every culture that was in some part oppressed as enslaved whatever and then they start going why do these people get what we don't get sure. it creates resentment and that's their goal is to keep racism alive and so i'm strongly against these policies that actually ultimately create social disaster they sound benevolent, yeah. and I used to be fooled by them. It's the difference now, between intent and impact. Like the intent is is beautiful. Like, oh, this is a beautiful intent. So much was taken yeah, right. from you, and so much was so the intent. Like, there's a liberated spark in the intent. Right. The intent of all of the transgender movement. It is our compassion. It is our love. Yes, of course. Like, you shouldn't be bullied. You should be able to express yourself how you want. But then the impact 
people aren't looking at the impact yeah. of what the intent is. Right. You know, and this is where there's a big gap is like, no, no, it's a beautiful intent. And then, but just take a look at what the impact of this will actually be. Yeah, that's right. Like what is actually going to happen. And, you know, that's the one thing that I really, I really do trust about Bobby is I don't, I'm sure there's things that I don't agree with him about either, but I trust that he's honest enough, humble enough and willing to learn. Even the fact that he said, you know, how much he changed his opinion about the border policy just by going there and learning. Like I trust that his goodness and his willingness to learn. That's why I'm, I've pushed all my chips in. It's not that yeah. I think he's in the perfected form now. I think he's someone who's willing to evolve, adapt. And that's such a crucial, crucial thing. And very rare thing. A very, days. very fucking rare thing. And the other thing I want to touch on is the hobbits, you know, Frodo and Bilbo, they could have easily just stayed in the Shire and been like, look, Sauron and Saruman, they're way off there. Like eh, the orcs, they're never going to make it to the Shire. Oh no, the orcs will make it to the Shire. Like if we don't stand at Helm's Deep, if we don't stand and actually put the ring of fire back in the source from whence it came, uh -huh. like the ring of power, the orcs are going to come everywhere. It's going to be a world that is actually run by the orcs. The Shire is not going to be safe. And that's one of the, I do think it's a beautiful movement that people are creating their own Shires. And I support that fully. And I've done it. I have my own farm in Lockhart. It's our own little Shire. It's our own little Hobbit Shire. But I'm not confused by the fact that the orcs will come and the orcs are an ideology. It's not a race. It's not a class. It's not a, not a person. It's an, uh, the ideology of empire. Empire will come. Anti-life will come and it'll come to the gates of the Shire. Mm -hmm. And so unless we go meet it where it is, it's coming for all of us anyways. Yeah. Like there's no, there's no escaping. And I think so many people are creating little Shires of privacy where they're willing to say something like, yeah, I really like Bobby. I was like, well, why don't you say so? Like, ah, you know, he's an anti-vaxxer and you know, mm -hmm. uh, my friends. And it's like, well, if you don't stand now, it's all going to come back deeper, deeper, deeper until the, you know, barbarians are at, at the gate. Yeah. Like we have to step forward and meet them where they are and resist that, resist that energy everywhere within ourself and across the board. And that's, you know, I'm trying to like ring Revere's bell and be like, hey, yes. yo, like, the empire is here. It's at our door and we got to meet it. And we may have different ideas about what's the most important place to make the stand and what hills we're willing to die on, but we got to pick some hill. Yeah. You know, we got to, we got to meet them where they're at. And, yeah. and that's, you know, that's the, the place where I stand now. And I see more people getting closer and closer, but it's like, we don't have so much time y'all. Like that's now right. it's is accelerating. The, now it's... is the time. Like, we have we have the opportunity to to halt this yeah. you know to halt the 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 horde that's coming the horde of idea and story it's coming again it's not about the people i think people can be confused in mass formation you know and i and i loved i had you know a podcast as well on mass formation like early on like i get it yeah matthias on yeah yeah i had right. matthias on and but it's like it's time. It's really, it's, it's just time. And I, and I've found in myself like, all right, man. All right. Like I've been in and I've been fighting little skirmishes here or there and putting things out here or there, but slowly, especially this year, 2023, I think it's just been an ever escalating curve where it's like, fuck it. What, what you're describing is, is the literally the hero's journey. Yeah. So, um, boy, it must've been 35 years ago. I was um, finishing my first film. Um, that's how old I am. And uh, I was living in San Francisco temporarily because the lab, it was back in the day when we edited on actual negatives, which <laughs> I'm so glad those days are over. It was archaic and, and a lot of work. And so I was rented a place by the lab, Monaco Labs in San Francisco. And um, and I was going to the lab every day because I it was a film I made on a shoestring and these guys were so cool. They loved the film so much. And they're like, listen, we want to cut you a better deal, but you have to come in and do the labor yourself. So they opened up their lab to me and taught me how to do it. And I was in there splicing negative and making my first film. And and down the street, way down the street, was um, a used bookstore. And I went in there one day and I saw 
a, uh, a box full of uh, VHS tapes. And it was Joseph Campbell. And I was like, uh, I'm going to get these. And it changed my world. So I started putting those things in the VCR and just watch these things and taking notes. And I started studying the hero's journey. And uh, for those who don't know, Joseph Campbell spent his lifetime studying the stories that we tell each other, that we've been telling each other since the beginning of time. And finding what the commonalities are from cave etchings to campfire stories and everything that's been left for us to, for him to examine, mythologies. What are the mythologies about? And he started re recognizing there's a common thread in almost every mythology. And he mapped it out, having studied every culture just about, that, and it was so profound of a work that this man left behind that years ago, Hollywood adapted most of Hollywood screenplays are based off of the hero's journey work. So from the most iconic movies that you remember, that I remember, from E.T., Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, all these films, all the way to the, to the modern day films of The Matrix and Avatar and all of them, they're all based loosely on a three-act structure that follows either directly and religiously the hero's journey or loosely. And ultimately what that is, is a reluctant hero that stumbles upon some crisis. And it's always big for the hero. It might be simple. It might be saving his dog from dying, or it might be a meteor approaching the earth, but it's important to the hero. And the hero is now charged with this sense of urgency. There's always a sense of urgency. You, you just mentioned time is speeding up. We need to hurry. So there's a sense, sense of urgency and the hero begins with the idea that I'm not qualified. So I need to go find the hero that can do something about this. And along the way, they meet all these characters that Joseph Campbell named everything from threshold guardians to tricksters to mentors. And so you'd meet all these people that are either trying to forward your momentum or thwart it. Either way, it's a lesson every time at every, mm -hmm. every venture. The Wizard of Oz is probably the most brilliant depiction of the hero's journey ever made. Because all those characters around Dorothy are aspects of her. Right. And the dog is an aspect of her consciousness, right? Yeah. And so the hero goes out on the journey to find the savior, the hero. And ultimately, what do they learn? So much so that it's totally cliche today. And if you see the end of Pandemic 2, I end with the last five minutes is all about this. The hero learns the forces within. You are the one. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, to the degree that all the Avengers movies and hero movies, my wife loves them, my kids love them. And, and they're always like, Dad, come watch with us. And I'm like, you're going to watch another one of those damn movies? And they're like, what do you hate about it? I'm like, it's the same story. Mm -hmm. just with different name and different characters. It's, it's this, I want something unique. And that's the hero's journey where there's always the third act crescendo. And that is the, I, I call it the fiery crescendo because that's always when I step out of the room, I watch a movie and go, okay, here we go. Fire crescendo. I get it. I know what's going to happen. Sure. It's so cliche every single time. And it's cliche because this is our story. And that is finally the hero is confronted with Joseph Campbell, often called it the dragon, which just means the dark force, Darth Vader, whatever it might be. The hero finally comes face to face in that fiery crescendo. And there's a battle that the hero doesn't think he or she is ready for. And it seems to be accurate because the hero is ultimately beat to the ground to the point of where the audience is left, if they do it right, considering, oh no, is the person I just invested my last two hours in and fell in love with and fighting for it, did they lose? We've seen it enough now that we know in the back of our minds, no, there's no way. It just doesn't, the story doesn't end that way. Unless it's Game of Thrones and then that's what the genius <laughs> of that because they yeah. killed off a bunch right, of heroes. Right, You're right, like, right. no, uh, no. Right. Really? So the, exactly, because we've reached this point where the uh, it's like a, you have to reinvent a magic trick because the yeah, audience yeah, yeah, learns. Totally. Everyone knows how that trick works now. So yeah. now we have to invert it, right? So that's Game of Thrones, perfect example. But ultimately what, you know, that moment where the her hero is beat to the ground and there's, there's that suspenseful moment where we think, oh no, he's dead, she's dead. 
And then there's that cliche moment where the finger twitches or the eyes start to flutter. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then they, what, they always rise and it's that moment where they just go. Yeah. And it's like something new is born. They mm -hmm. do die and there's a rebirth that happens. And they look at the dragon with a new power of I'm no longer this meek little creature. You've just awakened something in me. My own dragon. That is going to end you. Yeah. Because you're the darkness and I'm the light. And that's how it ends. That's the moment we're about to reach the fiery crescendo, I believe, in the story of our human, of our hero's journey. We're about to reach the fiery crescendo. Yeah. And it's not going to be pretty. And they're trying their hardest to ramp it up. They're trying the hardest to get civil war going because everything's coming into the light. And they're like, how do we distract the people? Will they hit a nuclear button just to get us distracted? They are that, that crazy. They might. But it's going to get, we are going to have a fiery crescendo. And the question is, is how many people are going to be rebirthed from that hero's death and rise up and beat the shit out of that dragon? And how many people are just going to surrender to it or join the dark forces yeah. because they're feel more secure with the dark forces because they just want to be on the winning team. And that's the question that, that, that we're facing right now. And there's people that are joining the dark forces. They're like, I'd rather just go. I, I don't think they're the good guys at all, but I just want to survive. So I'm going to go with the guys who have the most artillery and the most money. And it's a big mistake because the darkness always loses. That's right. Yeah, in the in the Star Wars mythos, you know, the resistance, the rebel forces are always wildly outnumbered. And that's also another thing. Even even if someone is really well trained and capable, you know, like that moment happens. Like look at the John Wick series. You mentioned dog. Shouldn't have killed John Wick's dog. Shouldn't have fucking <laughs> killed that guy's dog. There was a lot of headshots yeah. that happened yeah. <laughs> over four movies because that motherfucker that got his dog killed. He'd buried his guns. Yeah. He was he was happy to be peaceful. Yeah. You know, it's like same with Wallace. There's like people who are incredibly capable, but still the forces arrayed against them are so great that it's like this is impossible. But something in them drives and says, you know, like the Spartan ethos with my shield or on it. Like there's, there's things that are worse than death. And that's another thing I appreciate about Bobby. I said, Bobby, aren't you worried about getting assassinated? Mm -hmm. And he just looks at me and like a, like a hero would and said, there are things worse than death. Yeah. And I'm like, you're right. And like, I think we have to one, re-understand death and re-understand that death is we're always coming back. Don't worry. You're going to get another game. Yeah. You're going to get another play. But like, how are you going to live? Like, what is the memory of mm -hmm. who you are that you want to upload into the collective consciousness for the rest of life? Like, do you want to be the one that stood or do you want to be the one that, mm -hmm. that caved? And do you want to watch from that other, you know, purview of another dimensional reality and watch what happened because you and not enough other people stood? Yeah. Like, I don't want that. I don't want that in my memory and my karma for the rest of the time. Like, if it comes and it comes down to a final stand, like the hero has to reach that point where they're no longer afraid of their death. And yeah. the death could be the social death, the death could be kinetic death, it could be a variety of different things, but it's like, are you willing to face the end for something greater than yourself? Yeah, and most people are waiting until their dog is killed. Right. When we could just act out of choice, exactly. act out you of could love. Find that, you could find that inspiration within yourself. That's now. right. But when I asked you earlier about what would you live and die for, if someone would have gotten to John Wick in such a way that he would have, they could have convinced him to lose the love of his dog, then the murder of his dog would have not sent him in, into action. Right. That's why everything that's worth living and dying for is under attack. Because once you lose that connection, and it, love is the greatest, most fiercest power, once you lose that love, once you have nothing that you love in your life, including yourself, there's nothing to fight for. And that's where they want people is at a place of going, my relationship's over. I don't have, I don't own any really assets that, you know, you'll own nothing and be happy. The second part is a lie. You'll own nothing. I don't own any assets, nothing. I don't have any land to protect. It belongs to some guy I pay rent to. I don't even like him anyway. So whatever. Yeah. I don't have kids and my kids hate me. 
Yeah. You know, so uh, my so, relationship is, you know, de-eroticized to the point where I don't, doesn't yeah. matter. And, and all and, I, yeah. all I'm doing is taking pills and watching porn and fuck it. That's right. And then now you, now you understand the stormtroopers, right? I, I let my kids watch star Wars when they're very young, but we made it a lesson. And one of the lessons was I pause and I go, do you think all those stormtroopers are really bad people? Or do you think perhaps they're so scared of the dark side that they are putting on these masks and pretending to be on their side just because they want to survive? Yeah. You know, ask that question of a six-year-old. It's interesting. The answers you get back. And it's interesting what it stimulates in them. But that's where so many people are right now where they're, if you can take away everything that they, that they would live and die for, and then they go... Now they see the choices between the opponents. They go, okay, you have this opponent over here who appears to, it's not true, but appears to not have the resources that empire has over here. My, even though I don't have anything worth living and dying for, there's still this impulse to live in me. I mean, I mean, check it out. Go, go look at the homeless encampments and Skid Row. And you see these people, some of them are missing limbs and teeth and they're bent over. What keeps them alive? You would think that they'd get that bad and just be like, just take me. And some do, but very rarely. They'll suffer through on the cold or hot streets and being abused and robbed and beaten because the impulse of life is so great. Regardless of the quality of their life, they still want to live. That, te that should teach us something. And so those people who have lost everything worth living and dying for, before they're willing to just go away and die, they'll join the dark side if, it, if they think it's going to buy them a little more time in their bodies. Mm. And that's the dark side knows that. They know that they'll eventually join them. So you have all these good people out there, you know, good cops behaving, they came in wanting to protect and serve. And they know they're, it's like, but they're going to go off and, and arrest people for not wearing a COVID mask in a park. Well, I got to keep my job. You know, they go home and go, oh, this, God, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Can't believe I have to do this shit. You know, look at, you know, Australia, they were just tackling women that would dare to be on, outside without a mask. It was, it was in, in, unbelievable to see that these cops that you know damn well, very few of them believe that that is a violation worthy of tackling a woman over. And we have video of that happening over and over and over. So what does it, what does it take for them to operate in such a way that is so polar opposite to their own natural tendencies? You have to, you have to let who you are go. Otherwise, and that's where they want people. These cops just to be in a place of robotic, just give me orders. And that, that's the, you know, the famous saying, just following orders. It's very dangerous. Yeah. I, one of the things I'm writing about in a book that I'm working on um, called The End Game, it's, uh, it's working title right now, is Empire Loves Wars But Hates Warriors. Because a real warrior will know right and wrong. Right. You know, and real warriors woke up, wake up in all the wars and they're like, I'm not doing this. So many stories of like, I'm not fucking doing this. I'm not doing this. You see it in Avatar, you know, the helicopter pilots like, fuck this. I'm not bombing these fucking people. Or like, there's a, and this was also shown in Star Wars with Finn, the stormtrooper, who was like, fuck this, I'm out, you know? Yeah. And I think that's also something that gives me a lot of optimism is, you know, it's just interfacing with a lot of operators and cops and, you know, real high level military operators is, they haven't many most of them haven't lost the plot you know they're actually holding a yeah. deeper sense of value and i'm not saying all of them are good and i'm not saying you know categorically all military people and operations and cops are all good no. of course not but the empire hasn't captured the hearts and minds of the of the weaponry yet now if they could get robot robocops that they could control then that's a real fucking problem but the human spirit lives, especially in what I've seen from our country, it lives deep, like deep within that heroic impulse is an impulse for life, an impulse for good, 
and that can be steered the wrong way and you can dehumanize and propagandize and get people to believe they're doing the right thing, you know, in this kind of Nazism, yeah. fa fanatic kind of way where you've dehumanized the people so much that the baser instincts can take over. Of course, all that can happen. But I just feel like if Empire tries to make the final move and turn the police and the military against our own people, they won't. They won't. Yeah. They fucking won't. And that's where like in the end game, it's like, y'all, you got this wrong. Like you got people wrong. There's goodness that lives in people. That's right. That's and there's right. real, real goodness. And that's ultimately why we're going to win. And yes, it may seem like they have all the power just because we give it to them. I always say this when people talk about the, the importance of the second amendment and, and the people that are against the second amendment, which I can't say I was against it, but I certainly wasn't for it for most of my life. And, uh, and now I very much am is they'll say, how ridiculous are you second to a people thinking that should something break out, you're going to defend yourself against the art artillery of the, of the military. And, and the, no one ever challenges that with, so you assume the military is going to be on the dark side. You, <laughs> yeah. you know, is that what you assume? Like, really? You don't think that some of these people that actually join the military for the love of their country and for people and all of that, that there's going to be a breaking point for them where they go, no, fuck this. Yeah. We're going to defend the people. Yeah. So that's an assumption that the military is on the dark side. And it, and I don't think that's a, it's an accurate assumption. I agree. I agree I, I completely. I think it's, 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 it's a dangerous as assumption. Um, Oh, there's something you reminded me of a minute ago. I wanted, oh, um, how do you, how do you know what's true? How do you know when something's truthful? It's interesting. It's, uh, I feel like truth has a, truth has a resonance. It's like, how do I know if a guitar's in tune or not? I don't play guitar, but somehow the chords don't sound right. Uh-huh. Like the chords, like my instrument, you know, I've tried my best to clean my instrument and connect with truth. Like that's what the psychedelic journeys are for me, right. to connect to something that's true that I can feel in my body. And so the instrument, the radio that I've created has the ability, just like we can tell with music, like that's off pitch. Yeah, right. Like we know if we're, <laughs> if we're watching the, you know, the voice or something and something's, something's off pitch. Wrong. We're like, that was off pitch. Even if we're not a singer that's and we a, couldn't tell what that's, key That's a great is. way to describe it. That, yeah. that, that's a great way to describe it because the, the point I want to get to is we're all given an eternal guidance system. Yeah. And we have been severed from that in such a way that very few people actually utilize it. Yeah, we need, we need to be able to ground back in truth. Right. Again, and so is, the, the resonance of yeah. knowing it, I, I love that. That's a beautiful way to describe it. You can, even if you're not a musician, you can still know when something's in tune. You know when someone's singing out of tune, even if you're not a singer, you, you can feel, feel the vibration. Um, and if you ask someone to point to themselves, almost every single time they point here. Yeah, they go, point to yourself. They don't go here. They don't do this. They go here. There's something in here to do with the human heart that we have barely scratched the surface to understand that actually it's not just a pump that actually holds intelligence yeah. and is our center point. And I learned years ago, I did this workshop that on the first day I hated it. Cause I just thought, oh, this is woo woo crap. I don't think anything's happening here. And it was a bunch of people sitting in a room and we would ask ourselves questions and it was about tuning into a feeling that we got, a subtle, subtle feeling, which is also why we need to be still and meditate because we're, the world is so kinetic and so noisy and so distracting that we're, we're moving further and further away of this ability to accomplish what I'm, I'm, I'm sharing right now. And that is, we would ask ourselves these questions and the idea was just pay attention to this area of your body and what, what does it do when you ask yourself this question? And there were a couple of people that were like, oh, I kind of feel something. This is interesting. And I was, just, you know, from that skeptic, skeptical point of view, I was like, nothing. My buddy that I was with, one of my producers was like, oh, dude, <laughs> are we coming back tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, we should. Come back the second day. And finally I had an experience. And it was this series of questions. And we, it took a day just to clear out the noise. To be in the second day and particularly the third day, 
where by the third day, it was just very easy. You ask a question and there's one of two sensations, a contracting and a shrinking and a protecting the heart or an expansion and opening. And I started to think about all those spiritual paintings and stuff I saw where the light's bursting out of the heart of the person and they're doing this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's kind of what it feels like. And that's a yes. Your body is like the instrument panel on your car. It tells you everything you need to know if you just give it a glance, turn the lights on. Yeah. And so I've been working on this for a number of years. I don't even, not even close to having it mastered, but enough where I go, oh, this is the next technology for us to really pay attention to that literally can save us from being at war with all these ideologies, the opinion of men, hmm. is having this place of, we, by, like I said, day three, it'd be like a woman sitting next to me, is Jerry the man that I should marry? Uh-oh. <laughs> We're like, what happened? Ooh, my whole I'm like, uh-oh. And sure enough, you know, later I ran into her, she's like, yeah, Jerry was a cheater and whatever. It's like, interesting, mm. interesting. And then we'd ask a question, you know, and it'd be like, that's a full yes. What I call a full body yes, right? And I was like, the body goes, yes, that is a move for you to make. Should I take on this job? Boom. Or, uh-oh, maybe not. And sometimes it's right in the middle where it's like, I don't know yet. Maybe not enough data, not enough. Yeah, yeah I'm maybe not, not sure. enough awareness of your fears and other things it, that it's coming up against. Whatever your, it might be. The way that your identity is fused with things. Yeah. It's, it can get, it can get it, confusing. It can. But, there, but the guidance is there. And I was only three days into this. So, I mean, yeah. I was, I was a, a, a toddler, right? Trying to, trying to understand this. Not even, still not even close to mastering it. But definitely at a place where I can tell you it's real. Oh, yeah. And, and when we start to do that, and we say, listen to your heart, people go, my heart is speaking? Well, actually, yeah. Yeah, it's speaking yeah, through, uh, a, uh, through a whisper. Uh, and in my lineage, we call it the lahisha, which is the whisper of the divine, right. which whispers through our heart and out of our heart and then hopefully filters through our brain. But you can't hear a whisper when you're surrounded by noise. Yep. And that's why we have to get silent. And you can't, you can't see the truth when you're moving too fast. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to get still. It's, it's crucial that we counter the, the, the assault of the technical world the world of technology, which I love technology, I love innovation, not against it at all. I think everything has, like I said, the ability to be a weapon or a tool. Yeah. I look at AI and I use AI. It's unbelievable tool. Like what it's done for me as a filmmaker, to clean up audio, to create posters, to all the stuff. It's like to help me write. I used to have to hire four people. Now I just go in there, chat GPT and, you know, punch this up for me, make it better. Um, you know, great. That's way better words than I would have used. Awesome. Thank you, chat. It's wonderful. And it can totally destroy us. Mm -hmm. And the choice isn't someone else's. That's a mistake that we make. Like, I hope they use this right so it doesn't destroy us. Who's, who's they in that term? I hope you use it right so it doesn't destroy you. Right. Because it li literally can be the thing that frees up people from doing the back-breaking jobs that humans should never have done. Why should people go out for 12 hours a day and pick strawberries in the sun and end up with skin cancer and all the shit that happens to these poor people for, you know, $5 an hour? Could it free us up to the degree that robots are doing all the labor, the slave labor that we shouldn't be doing anyway so that we can maybe start to have dinner with our fam families again? So that maybe the fathers can start to play catch in the backyard with their sons again or, or the mothers can, you know, that we can be present with our, our wives. We can, we can have, you know, be um, sexually active mm -hmm. consistently where we don't lose that. I see friends around me all the time. They're just like, oh yeah, we haven't had sex in six months. What? Mm -hmm. Why? Just too busy. Too busy. Mm -hmm. Wow. You, you, that just tells me you don't know how to manage your time. Right. And that it's not a big enough priority for you. You don't understand the value of, of communing with, with your love in that way. And what it, what it does for your soul and for mm. your connection with each other. And so having that awareness that there's, there's this thing we can lean on. So good, we've lost trust in all these exterior authoritarian figures. Awesome. So now we have to come back to here because this is, this is what we feel to receive the infinite intelligence that you and I both call God. But if we don't slow down 
and quiet down, we'll never be able to hear it and feel it. It's, it's really I, probably one of the most important things we can do right now because then it's no longer like, what does my team say about Israel? Okay, I'm all for, uh, what does my team say about Gaza? I'm okay. It's like all we're doing is perpetuating narratives that keep us divided, keep us at war, keep us from evolving, keep us from loving, keep us from living what is intended to be an enjoyable, simple existence here on this beautiful little planet we call Earth, it's actually really easy. But we make it so difficult. No. By refusing to listen to this. No. The heart is the, the, heart is the doorway to the kingdom, to the kingdom of heaven, which is here and has always been here. We never got kicked out of Eden. <laughs> We've been here the whole time. I love you, Mickey. I love you too, brother. Thanks for everything you do. And thanks for being, uh, not only providing the information that you provide, but being the person behind that, that is a person that I can really trust and call a friend and know is a brother. Even if I don't know what you're doing, I know you're doing something. And, you know, I'm like, Mickey's doing his thing and we'll come together and we'll support each other whenever that yeah. pass. But we're all, we're all, you know, standing there together. And uh, just to know that and to know you is a, is a great joy in my life. So thanks for everything you do. Uh, Plandemic series. If you guys want to watch The Great Awakening, I cannot fucking recommend watching this more. This is so important to understand the larger story context that we're in. And you do such a great job as a storyteller there. Thank you, brother. So, Thank you for all you do. Yeah. Really, really, really appreciate uh, the friend that you are, the brother that you are, and the man that you are in the world. Thank you, brother. I need more of you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Let's do it, baby. Love you guys. See you next week. Thanks for tuning into this podcast with Mickey Willis. Make sure you check out his film, Great Awakening. You can find it at plandemicseries.com. And also check out our latest film, Unsafe and Ineffective, at unsafeandineffective.com. We love you guys. Keep the faith. Keep fighting. We got this. See you next week. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.